Um, and uh, it has indeed been a long road to get to this moment. Um, you know, a big thank you to Colleen Murphy Dunning uh, and Anna Pickett from Urban Resources Initiative and Pixon Center for Urban Ecology here at the Yale School of the Environment. You know, they've truly been outstanding collaborators in this. You know, Colleen supported this conference from when it was just an idea and Anna has done really incredible behind the scenes work to first plan an in-person event and then deconstruct that event and turn it into a virtual one. Uh, and Stephen Fold, who is a professor in the sociology department at Boston College, has been an instrumental support um, throughout the entire process of developing this conference. And I also really need to thank uh, Hilda Cruz and everyone at the Horticultural Society of New York um, in who, in what feels like another lifetime ago, taught me uh, so much of what I know about this topic. Uh, and of course, a, a very warm welcome and thanks to everyone at the New Garden Society uh, and all of the members of the Northeast Prison Garden Collaborative who set a powerful precedent for showing the value of this kind of connecting and gathering. Uh, and also thank you to the National Science Foundation for supporting this, the idea for meetings on this topic to advance research and practice. And finally, last but certainly not least, thank you to all of the presenters for their commitment to their work um, and for their patience in making this virtual event happen. Um, as the presenters well know, this included many rounds of emails as we fine tune the schedule and prepared for this virtual event. So a few words about the conference. <clears throat> um, as many or most of you know, this conference was initially scheduled to be held in person last March uh, in 2020 literally right as the country and the world uh, were shutting down. Back in the fall of 2019, we put out an open call for presenters. We received around 50 submissions, uh, many, uh, but not all of them are represented here in this program that we have over the next month. And this year's virtual event has 19 sessions with presenters from community-based organizations, colleges and universities, and governmental agencies. The conference theme is social and ecological infrastructure for recidivism reduction. You'll notice that presenters will interpret, define, and yes, even critique this theme widely. The one thing that all these presenters do have in common is that they all seriously consider the role of the environment and ecology in prisons, jails, and communities that are impacted by incarceration. And so, you know, in one way, social infrastructure and ecological infrastructure could be considered separate. Um, for example, in the infrastructure that's social and phone calls in relationships in organizations that weave the fabric of community that provide critical support. Um, it's also ecological infrastructure in terms of green infrastructures that are restoring environments, improving biodiversity and repairing ecosystems. But I think these presentations show quite powerfully how deeply interconnected the social and ecological worlds are. You know, just as people can make positive contributions to their local environment, our study and work with living in ecologies can be transformative for ourselves and our communities. And so just a few points on the timing and structure of this event, this conference, uh, kind of unusual for a conference. Uh, the schedule, as you're probably aware, is happening over the course of a month. Um, so we're meeting um, today until 5 p.m. and then tomorrow, um, starting at 1 p.m. and Saturday starting at 1 p.m. And then we meet for five consecutive Tuesday afternoons and um, we will be putting the conference program uh, into the chat and encourage you to reference it along the way. So we'll conclude with a final session on April 20th on next steps, um, which will require active participation with breakout groups for those who are actively practicing in the field um, or researching in the field, and we'll, there we'll discuss um, in an interactive way the needs going forward for the field and the potentials for collaboration. So we'll hope that those of you who are interested in you know, continuing to build collaborations um, and, and advance the field will join us then. Uh, and also uh, in the spirit of this only being a beginning, we're also um, really uh, thrilled to announce that there will, will be an in-person gathering in 2022. Uh, and along with this, uh, <clears throat> hopefully we'll also have, we'll be in touch uh, in between now and then about the planning of that. Um, and so we look forward to, um, for this being only the beginning of a conversation. 
Uh, and finally, a few logistics uh, of participation um, in response to some questions we've received and also some other details. So you can attend any session, uh, regardless of what sessions you checked off on the registration form. You should receive email reminders the day before presentations. Um, but certainly, if you haven't yet, um, do look at the conference program schedule and make note of what presentations you'll attend. Uh, and in order to give maximum time to the presenters, um, and also with recognition that you all have this conference program on hand, um, we're not going to be reading the full bios of each presenter. Um, uh, uh, we encourage you to refer to this, the conference program at, at hickson.yale.edu um, to learn more about our accomplished speakers. And indeed, with many of our speakers and most, if not all, we could um, give lengthy bios that would take a long time to introduce because of all of their great work they're doing. Now, uh, each presentation will have a slightly different structure, but they mostly will have some time, uh, but they will all mostly have time for questions or discussion with the presenters. Uh, those listed as workshop typically ask for more participation. Uh, we're gonna be leaving the chat feature open so you can post questions to presenters there, or you can wait until the end to ask your question in person. Uh, one helpful function here, if you haven't been familiar with it in other Zoom, events is the raise hand button, uh, which will allow presenters to see you uh, and be able to call on you uh, so you can uh, make your comment or question. And also in order to facilitate connections, we've created a conference networking form that we'll post at the beginning of this session. If you'd like to connect with others, you can add your name and interest to this form. So this is a way of opting into, um, you know, uh, being able to connect others. Obviously, one of the benefits of a conference is being able to, you know, uh, have those conversations outside or just after an event. And hopefully with this uh, networking form, that will be a, a resource that you can follow up with folks in that way um, with the people who uh, wish. So we'll be posting that at the beginning of each session. Some sessions are being recorded, um, like right now and all of the sessions today will be recorded. Um, we will announce sessions that are being recorded as their beginning or at the beginning of the day. Um, and some people have asked about what specific ones. Um, we are still waiting on, on people's um, confirmations coming in on the recording. So we will update you at the beginning of each day and, and as we're able to on, on what's being recorded. Um, but we do urge you to attend all the events live when possible, um, as oftentimes your questions and participations are, are essential. Um, and so at this point, uh, I will turn it over to Colleen McDunning, a director of Hickson Center of Urban Ecology and the Urban Resources Initiative at the Yale School of Environment. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, and I'm just gonna find my slides and share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, so just to start off with appreciation to you, Matthew, because um, he's been not only an incredible partner, but this is really his brainchild. So he came to me with this idea of convening the event together. And I was immediately keen to do it because it directly connects to our work here in New Haven. So I would like to take this opportunity to briefly share with you some of the work we're doing in New Haven that um, fits with this conference theme. I run a program called the Urban Resources Initiative or URI for short at the Yale School of the Environment. And our mission is to foster community-based land stewardship promote environmental education and advance the practice of urban forestry while also providing Yale students an opportunity to have clinical learning. Our kind of flagship program that we um, have been running for over 25 years is called the Community Green Space Program. And this, uh, we, we started in 1995, really is a vehicle for a community to take action on their own environmental agenda and for us to provide support of technical and material resources for them to carry out their vision for their community on their own environmental priorities. Um, and this is just one example um, of a park in New Haven called Cherry Ann Park where the neighbors have completely transformed a formerly neglected park into a real gem in New Haven. Our green skills or our green job program, we started in 2007 with a partnership with the city of New Haven and with local high schools. And our idea initially was to establish a green job program for planting the city street trees as a means of also giving high school students paid work experience in environmental projects and in mentorship. For many, if not most of our high school students that have participated, this is their first job experience. 
In 2010, we expanded that program of planting street trees to include adults with barriers to employment. On a typical year, about 1,200 men and women are released from prison to New Haven. Part of the persistent cycle of poverty from one generation to the next is due to children who grow up in poverty with a parent in prison. As just one example of the relationship of incarceration to poverty, it can be seen through this, as you see in this slide, of homelessness prior to arrest. This social vulnerability in New Haven is the, really the basis and motivation for our partners to use green jobs as a tool for resolving some of these inequities and for reducing recidivism. So in 2010, we began a partnership to, with the city of New Haven and other local nonprofits that were working on removing barriers to employment. One that we began with in that time was a nonprofit called, oh, my cat just advanced the slide, sorry. <laughs> quite a bit, um, um, called a, a nonprofit called Emerge. And we have since that time been working with that nonprofit throughout. And um, in the program, we both plant trees on, at the request and um, desire of a local resident um, who takes on the adopting the care of the tree, but they are planted as part of a green job, paid green job training for adults with a history of incarceration during the week and high school students on the weekend. In 2015, we expanded that work to um, also include green infrastructure through the construction of bioswales, which we carry out in partnership again with Emerge, but also with the city engineering department. Um, and this created an opportunity for us to expand the skill sets that are uh, part of our training um, and more opportunity for the adults who are coming back um, from prison to New Haven. So these are just um, to illustrate some of the construction technique of um, building bioswills, which they're a form of green infrastructure to manage stormwater runoff, which is gonna become an increasing challenge and problem in particularly in cities with lots of impervious surface and an increase in rainfall um, because of climate change. So in all of these cases, our purpose is really to, as a kind of address this theme of the conference, think about both the biophysical challenges in the landscape, as well as the social, cultural, and economic burdens that we have um, with our vulnerable populations in the city. This is just the um, kind of end product of a bioswell, in case you're not familiar. Um, and for, for residents of New Haven, whether it's the trees that are planted or uh, biosols that are constructed, oftentimes their, um, their value is often aesthetic, that the neighbors find them as a um, beauty, not just their function in the landscape in terms of ecological services. So I'll just end with this slide, um, which is a little bit of the background um, from our Emerge partner. And I just wanna be clear that we recognize our part in um, green job training is only a piece of the supports that are needed for people returning from incarceration. With Emerge, we have planted over 6,500 trees in New Haven since the onset of this program with about 200 adults. Um, approximately 2,500 people have adopted those trees with a greater than 90% survival rate. So our city government partners are pleased that it's reaching many residents across our city and also um, with a high survival rate of the trees, but also it's really serving this critical um, opportunity for removing barriers to employment. The EMERGE program tracks the um, recidivism rate of people who have participated in their program. And you can see some of the background here in the slide from our colleagues at EMERGE of the kind of um, experience that the participants have coming into their program and leaving their program, two thirds leave to full employment or to education and their overall recidivism rate is 14% after two years. So just a um, sign of the success of their program with us as a partner, but I'll, again, um, Green Jobs is only a part of that. Part of the success comes from other services and supports that Emerge provides to the participants in their program. So with that, I'll, um, I don't know that we really have time for questions, but I have my um, email address there. Um, but if, if um, maybe we do have time for a, a question or two, if anyone has them, um, otherwise I will hand back to Matt um, who would introduce our 
our next presenters. And just again, um, gratitude to Matt for organizing the conference and to all the presenters for taking the time to share their work with us um, throughout the coming weeks. Thank so you, I'll Colleen. Just, and in fact, I think we do yeah. have time um, for uh, a question or two. And just specifically, because I'm looking, someone put in the chat something about a bioswale um, uh, to clarify something about that term. Um, so I don't know if you want to. Sure. Um, it's a basically like a bioretention system that's um, built along the roadway. And um, you might think of it as a rain type of a rain garden, but it's um, rain gardens are typically next to a structure like a house where you're capturing water off the roof. Whereas a bio so is a bioretention system built right along the street and it captures water running off the street and goes into this bioswale or bioretention as a way of removing stormwater that would otherwise go into the storm drain. And in major flooding events, you know, all, that it happens because there's too much rainfall on streets or impervious surfaces going into the system. So we see um, a lot of flooding with climate change, you know, all across our country, you see all the time, whether you think of major floods in Texas or following Katrina, uh, you know, from hurricanes to, or, or here we had Storm Sandy um, and other major storm events. So by reducing the amount of water going into the storm drains and putting it into a bioswale or bioretention system, it's a much more cost-effective way um, of treating that storm water. And it is uh, something that is a great green job. Um, it doesn't require heavy equipment and is um, something that's easy to train. And um, um, yeah, so it's a very effective form of green infrastructure. I see that there's also a question about whether our work is publicly funded or funded through Yale. The vast majority of our funding comes from um, city contracts or grants or individual donations, not from the university. So the biosoil construction is funded. We've, we have constructed about 200 of them. Some of them have been from grants, but most of it is through a competitively bid contract that we received with the city. The city funded that, um, that work through federal funds um, following Hurricane Sandy. And I'm just gonna say, I see Ronaldo Cruz in the house. So I'm gonna shout out to Ray from Emerge. So if folks have any questions about Emerge, I'm so glad you're with us, Ray. Thank you, Colleen. It's a pleasure to be here. Hope we learned something. Um, yes, anybody who wants to reach out and learn something about Emerge, they can reach out. Um, we really enjoy your support. Great, thanks so much. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, and I will just highlight um, before introducing the speakers here, I'll just say too, I think something um, about the work of the Urban Resource Initiative um, that is uh, especially uh, valuable. You know, someone who's at a university now and I know the kind of community university partnerships um, in some way uh, in, the, in, the partner, in the idea of bringing together different groups, whether that's, you know, group students from university and people in a community or whether that's um, different industries with each other. In some ways that is really, I think we'll see at the core of um, a lot of the work of, of this conference. So it really is um, a, a really wonderful to have um, uh, Urban Resource Initiative be hosting this event as well as, as really an example of the kind of partnerships and collaboration for, for practice um, across, you know, institutions and, you know, um, the kind of bridge between um, uh, institution and community that can sometimes be uh, challenging. So, so thank you for your work and we're so glad that's part of this conference. So um, with that, um, we will go and uh, introduce the first speakers. Um, now, some folks have joined, so I will very briefly say um, that uh, a few points just to remind um, folks that we're not going to be um, introducing, uh, reading the entire bios of speakers. Um, so. Uh, if you, we'll be posting in the chat um, the link to um, uh, the, the conference program, which can be found at uh, hickson.yale.edu. 
Um, and there you'll see their full conference bios um, and can um, follow up that way. I uh, will also be <coughs> posting um, in the chat uh, a link to a uh, conference networking page where you can opt in to put your contact information down if you'd like to um, hear from other um, conference presenters. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I will be uh, glad to get a few minutes head start here on introducing um, the our, our first presenters of the day. So just to give you an outline of how this day will go as it's listed in the schedule, we have a presentation from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll have a moment for a brief break. You can think of it as um, as in a conference, kind of that coffee or snack or a stretch break. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, indeed use that as a break to um, stretch and walk around, especially if you are going to be here for the whole duration of the afternoon. Um, and so at 2.15 p.m., we'll start with our, our second presentation, uh, which will uh, again go for an hour until 3.15, and we'll have another one of those short 15-minute um, breaks, um, and we'll start the next presentation at uh, 3.30 p.m., the final presentation of the day. So um, <clears throat> the uh, other final thing to note here um, about these presentations today is that um, all the presentations today will be being recorded. Um, and so um, just um, for your information there. So uh, without further <clears throat> kind of delay, I'd like to introduce our first presentation of the day. Um, not just a gardening program, a dynamic approach to healing, transformation, and reentry. Uh, so we have uh, on this topic, we have Karen Sue, co-director of the Insight Garden Program, Arnold Trevino, reentry coordinator and co-facilitator of Insight Garden Program, and Sol Mercado, nursery technician at Planting Justice. So welcome all. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Hi, Karen, I think you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you to the conference organizers again for creating the opportunity for us to share about our work. This is really exciting for us to finally be able to connect at a national level with other groups doing this type of work with the incarcerated community. Um, we also really wish we could have been with you all in person. I know last year we were really excited to travel to Yale, but nonetheless, we're really grateful to be here today. And we know that for the past year, probably many of you like us have been doing lots of Zoom meetings, webinars. So with that in mind, we're gonna try to make this presentation as interactive as possible. Uh, we'll show a few slides. We'll show some pictures of our program in action and the three of us, myself, Arnold, and Sol, are really just going to have a conversation that we hope will help to articulate the context of who we are, what it is that we do, and why we are not just a gardening program. If you have any questions or comments that come up during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. We're going to do our best to monitor them, and we're going to have time at the end for a Q&A. So first, I'd like to start with some introductions. Um, my name is Karen Shui, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Insight Garden Program. I've been with the organization for about six years and actually started off as a volunteer at one of our programs in Vacaville, California. For the past six years, I have helped to co-facilitate that program, and I've also held many different roles within Insight Garden. I'm also a coordinator for the Transformative In-Prison Work Group. This is a statewide coalition here in California of about 55 community-based organizations that provide healing and transformative programming inside of the state prisons. I wanted to turn it over to Sol and Arnold for them to introduce themselves. And I'm wondering, Sol, if you wouldn't mind going first and introduce yourself and share a bit about who you are. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sol Mercado. Um, I was formerly incarcerated in Central California Women's Facility uh, in 
Chowchilla, California for uh, 16 years. Um, how I became involved with Inside Garden Program is, uh, you know, uh, I was, and I, I noticed that there was a, a, a program going on and it just got my attention. And when I started gardening and everything, I just fell in love with it. And uh, um, they helped me through the whole uh, process of me being released and um, to me being released and, um, and my re-entry into society. And I'm still involved with them to, um, today, even though I got released. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sol. Arnold, would you be able to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon to the west, to the east coast, and good morning to the uh, west coast. Uh, my name is Arnold. Uh, I am a former lifer. I spent 25 years in prison. Uh, I was introduced to the Inside Garden program uh, in 2017, and after serving 25 years in prison, I was approached by uh, Amanda Berger, who is my supervisor uh, now. Uh, when I was doing as a result of our presentation. Uh, she heard my story, what I've done, what I've been doing. And she asked me if I wanted to help launch the program at one of our local prisons here in California. And after spending 25 years in prison, the last place I wanted to go back is into prison. So it, it, it uh, had to think about that, uh, very intimidating initially, uh, but I accepted the, the challenge and uh, I have not regretted it. It's been a blessing. Uh, I really enjoy going in there, uh, giving hope to the people in there, especially with the gardening. It's very um, colorful uh, program within uh, the prison. Uh, I was released, as I said, I was a lifer. I was released in 2011. I went back to school in 2012 and I graduated in 2019. I uh, earned my master's degree in social work and uh, I've never looked back. It's been a blessing. Uh, I almost have 10 years uh, in April next month. Uh, we'll mark 10 years that I've been out. And it has been a, an incredible journey, uh, very adventurous for sure. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Arnold. I'm really happy that um, the audience is gonna be able to hear more from you, Arnold, and you, Sol. So thanks for being with us today. A little bit about Insight Garden Program. So Insight Garden Program, or we'll refer to IGP a lot as shortened. Um, was found, founded in 2002 with the mission to reconnect people in prison and in reentry to self, community, and the natural world. We originally launched at San Quentin here in California. Um, this picture on the slide is of our garden there. And then in 2014, we began to expand. And today we're now in 11 facilities in the state of California, serving about 400 participants across men's, women's, youth facilities. We've also expanded to two sites out of state in Indiana and Ohio. And so our program has two main components, which is our in-prison program and our reentry mentorship program. So we'll share more about the reentry work later in this presentation. Here you can see more about our in-prison program. What we do is we run a 48 week long curriculum that utilizes four arcs of learning. You can see those arcs listed here on the left side of the screen. And through these arcs, we ground participants in mindfulness practice, environmental education, permaculture training, and what we call inner gardening or introspection. Throughout the program, we also co-design and maintain a garden in the prison, which serves as both a space for therapeutic and healing. Um, and it's also a living classroom where we can apply the concepts that we're covering in the curriculum. A core piece of our in-person program was that the program was rooted in the consistency of our weekly classes. We were able to build deep trust and relationships inside of a safe container. And there was this educational and healing aspect of being in the gardens together. So we'll talk more about how this all sort of shifted for us during COVID later in the presentation. But right now, I wanna shift over to Arnold and Sol. 
Um, you both have personally experienced our program from different vantage points, right? So Arnold as a co-facilitator and a re-entry coordinator for IGP and Sol as a participant at our program at CCWF. So a question for you, Arnold, is from your experience, what is valuable about IGP's mission to reconnect incarcerated people to self, community, and the natural world? You know, Karen, uh, through the experience that I've had uh, as I uh, go into the Avenal State Prison, which I, uh, I'm, I work in as a co-facilitator, uh, it's completely barren in there. It just, uh, it's a complete uh, nature deficit. Uh, it's all dirt, uh, cages, fences, uh, concrete walls. And off to the corner, you can see our little garden and which is uh, the colorful part of the, of the prison. And uh, the connection that it does, uh, as you walk in the, 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 the complete, the, the deficit there, the nature deficit, you could even see it in the, the eyes of the people that are there. Uh, they're just dull eyes, you know, without uh, hope uh, in their eyes. And uh, until we come around to that corner of the, of the yard where there is a garden and it's colorful with uh, pollinators uh, flying around, different insects, different bugs, different uh, birds. Uh, and you can see that there is hope uh, being given to them as a result of this, of the gardening program that we have there. Uh, it brings people together in prison. It's, it's a very isolated, segregated place. Each race has to stay with their own groups and they're not allowed to cross boundaries. However, uh, gardening, it brings back memories of almost every individual there has shared that they have had some kind of gardening experience, either with their grandparents, their parents, uh, their brother and sister, and it just takes one individual, regardless of race or what group they run with, and they start talking about their experience with the garden, and then the next individual starts talking about it. And then next thing you know, you have this camaraderie going, and uh, all barriers are broken. Uh, they just start crossing over their, their, those lines and just start sharing. And I've seen, I've even heard some of the individuals talk about that they've been in the dorm with individuals for the last 8, 10, 12 months, and they never shared a single word with each other. And gardening, when they start talking about gardening, it brings them all together. And, you know, there are these 16 man dorms that only the two bunkies, I mean, they might talk to another uh, neighbor uh, about gardening. And then somebody across the dorm will hear about it and then they'll get engaged. And now they have a camaraderie going. And, and you witness this all through the connection that they have with plants and gardening and, and their vegetable garden that they have in the backyard. Uh, this gardening, I've also witnessed, uh, you know, it brings a kid out of everybody. Yeah, I've, I have personally witnessed, and I wish I could bring in a camera to catch these priceless moments uh, in prison. So you got people in there that are all tattooed, uh, their faces are all tattooed, they're very intimidating looking. They're all muscular walking around the yard, and, and, uh, and they walk by the garden and they see a, a hummingbird or a butterfly or something. And then for that split second, they'll take that mask off and get all giddy all the kids just like oh look at the hummingbird and, and, and they just get all happy about it and and then for that split second then they'll regain the composure and put that mask back on and oh, i didn't say that and they'll keep on walking but it brings out the nature the the, the human side of each individual uh and, and i and i wish i had a camera for all these priceless moments uh just to show them that you know what you're human it's okay to take that mask off you know you don't need to wear it i understand it's a defense mechanism in prison but not necessary you know, one of the best metaphors, metamorphoses that I can, uh, um, the, the metamorphosis of a butterfly, you know, we, we have this, uh, when we go in, we, we went in prison because we did something wrong. We, we, we were ugly, like the caterpillar. Nobody really likes the caterpillar. The, the appearance of a caterpillar looks very intimidating, very not uh, beautifying. However, you know, and that's the way we walk into the prison. And then there comes a point in our lives where we, the transformation takes place, where we have to take ourselves apart and analyze ourselves and which is which is like the caterpillar that goes into the cocoon that tears itself apart and then it repieces itself together and that's what we're doing while we're in there in these programs that give us that chance to take a look at ourselves to take a look at our inner self and we piece ourselves together and in the end when we are ready we break out of this cocoon and into this beautiful butterfly uh, 
things are possible and, and individuals that are given that hope through the IGP, through the Inside Garden program, we get to witness it and feel it and, and we get to re-examine ourselves, analyze ourselves and, and, and become this uh, fruitful in, individual in the end. That's my, uh, my take on my, that's my experience with the, the program. Awesome. Thanks, Arnold. That's beautiful. I mean, I think it really speaks to like the the mission that we have for IGP, right, which is the the power of reconnecting to nature and how that ends up reconnecting you to yourself and to your community. Um, you mentioned this before in your introduction, but I know you've shared with us, too, like you never dreamed of coming back to prison, but now you do as a co-facilitator. So I'm curious about what role that has played in your own healing journey and what you feel like the impact is on people who are still inside when they see you come in. Yeah, going in, you know, it was uh, when I was first asked to go back in, uh, I was uh, certainly intimidated. I didn't want to go back. It, it was an ugly place for me for 25 straight years, did not enjoy one minute of it. Uh, and when I was asked to go back in, you know, I took on that challenge. Hopefully I can make a difference. Uh, I did want to give back. Uh, giving back, as I've heard for years, you know, a lot of people in prison, they want to give back to the community. And that word has been burnt out. Uh, for me, it, it's burnt out. It just, uh, and it has it's just a, a surface, a word on the surface. Uh, and then in giving back, the, the initial thought of other individuals is, is, is to go back into the community and pick up trash. And giving back is more than that. Uh, going to the prison, I found it to be very, very therapeutic. And if I could change policy, I would make it mandatory for anybody who has shown stability, at least been out here in the society for a year, and shown stability to go back in and give back and to give hope to those who are still incarcerated, who have given up hope, who don't believe that we can move forward. Uh, in going back in, I was given a tour when we first started the Inside Garden program at Avenal. Uh, one of the lieutenants there, he gave us a tour of the yard, of the different buildings, even the housing units. And it just coincidentally, I spent seven years at Avenal State Prison uh, out of the 25. And uh, we went to the housing unit that I was actually uh, residing in. And in going in there, that we, I, I got caught up in a riot uh, one time. And uh, of course, nobody, my group didn't know, but I was anxious. I could feel my heart thumping. I mean, literally thumping as I went back in there and I replaced that ugly memory. I ended up getting my head split open that riot, uh, resulting in 10 stitches. Uh, stitches. And uh, I was able to relive it mentally. And, and I saw where it took place and I was able to replace it with that little tour because it was a more uh, embracing, you know, I, I, I took that old memory, I was chasing this ghost and, and I replaced the old with a good memory. And after that, I found going to the prison very embracing, very warm. Uh, and, uh, and I would like for more people to go back in and to give back, to give hope, just walking into the prison and other people who recognize you. Uh, and I see these guys, as soon as I walk in on the yard and they'll start whispering, they're on the side of the yard uh, against the walls and, and, you can, and I can only guess what they're saying uh, I, I don't know verbatim, but I know they're talking about me and I know they were, hey, he was a lifer. He was here. He did time here. And, and you can see some of the, the, the light, their eyes light up and, and like, wow, he, you know, he's actually came back in and, and, and people ask, they ask questions. Hey, were you here? And I heard you were, you did time. Yeah, I did. And we could change and you can change, you know, we can, we can all do this, you know, it's up to you. And, uh, during the period of time that it takes us from to walk in from the gate to our classroom. You know, I get a lot of questions from, from a lot of individuals uh, about, you know, what the process and what they need to do and is it possible? Yes, it certainly is possible. Uh, it's all about you wanting to do that, make that change and give back. Thanks, Arnold. I think you're, you're a very like humble and modest person, but I, I hope you realize that um, you, the, it's kind of like composting your experience. It's like you you spent so much of your life incarcerated, but to now take your time to go back, provide programming and provide kind of support and guidance for participants is um, very impactful. And I think you really serve as sort of a leader for our whole, whole staff as well. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. 
Um, so I have a question for you. So hi, hi. Something that we do at IGP, right, is we move between the inner and the outer garden. So I'm curious, what did inner and outer gardening mean to you as you moved through IGP's program while you were incarcerated? Okay, uh, first of all, when I was introduced to IGP, I thought it was only like a garden program because I seen, um, I seen them, uh, the inmates working on this garden, building a garden, and I was like, and I asked one of my friends, I said, uh, what is going on over there? And she goes, oh, it's the inside garden program. I said, inside, like inside, like inside. And they're like, yeah, it's a good program. You should join it. And I was like, you know, I'm interested. So I signed up and I, um, and then I got chosen to be in the program. So when I, um, when I went in there, I started working in the garden and learning things in the garden. And, uh, but then there was this other part that got my attention. Um, then we had classroom, uh, group work and I was like wait a minute we have a group too so when we started uh when I when I went in there they had all these uh different speakers from different organizations coming in and um and share about their organization and how they can help us and stuff like that but then what really caught my attention is about the inner work and I was like what does inner work have to do with gardening and uh, so when they started sharing and they started talking about different topics and stuff like that, I started realizing, oh, so gardening, you know, it's like, you know, it's the same as working on yourself. You know, when you see a garden and it needs to be, um, the plant needs to be pruned, the weeds need to be pulled, it needs to be water, it needs to be taken care of. That's the same thing with your life. Like, you know, if you really want to change your life, um, you have to take, you know, you have to weed the things out of your life and water, you know, what, you know, like water it and work on yourself and really take care of that flower of that garden, that plant so that it could grow. So yeah, and that's how I uh, seen it in my life. I was like, okay, so if I want to change my life, I have to prune and I have to prune things, you know, I have to pull the weeds out of my life, the bad things out of my life so that I can leave myself room to grow. And that's what exactly what I got out of the IGP program. And I, as soon as, you know, like um, once I started attending IGP, I grew, uh, you know, personally um, in so many ways. Uh, my life, um, I feel like my life started changing in a different direction. And I started seeing the, uh, the growth in me and how, um, and how it was in the garden, uh, the outer garden, um, I started seeing how I was learning different skills, how I was like um, using gardening as my coping skill and how I found freedom, how I found peace and um, how I forgot that I was in prison because uh, when I went to the garden, um, we all left the, the like how, um, how Arnold said about the mask. Everybody put their mask down and everybody just started getting along. And you could see how uh, being in that program, it was changing a lot of people and how it was making you feel like you were, um, like you were free. And so we became like a family. And I feel like inside garden program, they, um, you become like a family. You, you put all your guard down, you learn, uh, you learn different skills. We designed the garden and we, uh, and we all work as a team and we became, and literally we became a family. And as we share in the groups, everybody put their guard down and you could see people crying. You could see people opening up and sharing things that they never share in other groups. And that's what I really love about this program that you're able to be yourself. And at the same time, you're learning skills that you can use in a job. And, um, but at the same time, working on yourself and think and, you know, allowing the garden and allowing nature to like help you heal. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sol. Yeah, I think it's um, what you just shared is like the true testament to how much nature can really teach us. And like inner gardening is not something IGP invented. It's not, not anything new, but it's about the carving out the space to be with each other and to really allow nature to teach us what we already know. So I wanted to share a little bit about how IGP responded to COVID. Um, for context, here in California, nearly 50,000 incarcerated people have had the COVID-19 virus. 
And on March 16th of last year, so 2020, the California Department of Corrections stopped um, allowing all outside visitors to come into the prison. So it's been um, exactly a full year since folks inside have been able to access programming like ours or to see their loved ones and their families. So in April of last year, we got together as a staff to decide how we could be um, supporting participants during this crazy time. And our main priorities were really to stay connected, stay supportive, and to use new and creative ways to do so. So we developed a correspondence-based version of our curriculum. This now gets sent out to about 400 participants across California every month. We also doubled down on our reentry work. So we were making sure to find ways to support people who were reentering during the pandemic. And then for participants, both inside and out, we were doing our best to try to provide different ways for people to cope um, and take care of themselves during such a stressful time. So Sol, another question for you is um, like, you were there for it all. You know, you were there before the pandemic, during, and then you came home, um, you know, recently during COVID. So I'm wondering if you could share what it was like to stay connected to IGP while you were um, still inside during the pandemic. Uh, yes, I was, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, I was in the middle of getting prepared for a parole hearing. And uh, uh, so I was corresponding with um, IGP through distance learning. And then um, when I when I uh, let them know that I was getting ready for a parole hearing, they 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 were very um, they they helped me throughout the whole process. Uh, I was waiting for uh, an attorney. To, um, I reached out to a, a law firm to help me get represented for my parole hearing, and. Um, IGP advocated for me and they were able to represent me and I got these amazing attorneys that helped me and uh, throughout my whole process. IGP helped me with getting resources. IGP get, uh, helped me get a job before I even got out with Planning Justice, which I'm working with them right now. Um, IGP uh, supported me emotionally. IGP reached out to my family. They helped me. Um, basically, IGP helped me put up my whole uh, portfolio and helped me through the whole process. And uh, um, we were locked down in the prison. So we were going through anxiety, we were going through depression. I was, you know, I was going through the, um, like we, the girls that we went to the garden, we, um, and that we were in the same unit, we would talk and we'd be like, man, I wish I could go to the garden. And, uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna reach out to them and I'm gonna let them, I'm gonna ask them if we could, if, if there could be a possible way that if even um, distance, you know, the social distancing and everything, if we could go to the garden and clean the garden, because every time I will pass by, I will see how the weeds will grow. Like there was like weeds that were like 10 feet high. And I was really like heartbroken that I couldn't go to the garden. And so we were talking about how the lockdown, it was getting us depressed. We couldn't work, we couldn't do nothing. And uh, um, but IGP went above and beyond to ask permission for us to be able to uh, respect the social distancing and the uh, COVID uh, regulations and all that stuff that we could go to the garden. And that really helped all of us to be able to go to, um, to the garden and work on and clean the garden and tend to the garden. And that helped us deal with our depression and our anxiety. And um, we were more happy, like we were like we were excited to go to the garden. We were like, oh my God, like we get to go to the garden today. We're not gonna be locked down. We're gonna have some peace, you know. So I would we would go there and we will see how um like each one of us will pick a side and we will put our music on and we will weed and we will be there for hours and then we didn't want to leave. And uh, um the other um the other process was uh, that they were helping me get support letters from my family helped me throughout my reentry, and uh, um, and I was found suitable for parole, and they supported me throughout the whole way, and that's how um, you know, the, those months, um, IGP really supported me even throughout this whole pandemic, and um, even still, um, I got released. They were there at the gate waiting for me, um, 
they 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 gave me the toiletries. They helped me with um you know with support group even after incarceration. And um, I got my job today, and I really love because of IGP being uh, working in, in the garden there. I really um, got to love the garden, and now that I work at a nursery, and I really love being around nature. And that's one thing, like um, like I could say that IGP really uh, changed a lot of things in my life. Things uh, it helped me to open many doors that I never knew it was possible. Thanks so much, Sol. So I briefly wanted to just go um, give you all like a broad overview of how we try to develop our distance learning, um, which is still going on. We're sending in packets every month. This is an example of a survey we sent to participants by mail. Um, we knew that our groups, everyone had different learning styles, different needs during this time. So we created this survey to hear what was working or what would work for them and what they were needing. And then we used those responses to really inform our correspondence curriculum. Here's an example of a recent packet we sent out. Um, we have a team of staff and volunteers who respond to every letter that we receive. And we've noticed that through these letters, um, folks are both responding to the content of the curriculum, but also to their experiences of COVID, including getting sick and needing to be quarantined or even hospitalized. And then here are two examples of responses we have received from the packets. Um, this was from a prompt about visualizing your favorite plant and here someone created an ode to the eggplant and the other one is to a mango. And we've heard from participants that they really appreciated these packets because one, it was a way to stay connected to the group, um, but also that it's given them something else to even think about besides the virus. And that in itself has been healing. So similar to what Sol was saying is like being able to get into the garden just for a minute, forget about the pandemic and just be in a place of, of some peace. During COVID, we've also been able to adapt our program um, at the youth facility here in California. So at the youth facility, they have access to Zoom. So we've been running a virtual version of our program since last fall. And here you can see some of the components of that program. We sent participant seeds, which they've been growing on their own. Um, we built in lessons around the parable of the sower by Octavia Butler. And we've also been able to integrate more art-based learning and expression. And now for our re-entry work. So in 2020, IGP kind of had a crash course in re-entry. Um, in late 2019, we had just sort of begun to formalize our re-entry model and then COVID hit. So when our in-person programs were shut down, our reentry team had to really think about how we could safely and compassionately be supporting participants, knowing very well that reentry is already a challenging and can sometimes be a traumatic experience. And then with the COVID, that these challenges would be even greater. So we formed a reentry team. Um, this is a team that is led by four formerly incarcerated staff members. And right now we're providing reentry support to about 200 participants inside of prisons and out here in the community. And in this slide, you'll see sort of a snapshot of our reentry model. So we have a pre-release process that involves staying in touch with participants either through mail or we have a collect call phone line. This is when we begin coordinating with participants and sometimes their families and loved ones around their reentry plan. Um, so we'll talked about this a little bit already. It's like on the day of release, we're actually meeting folks at the gate. We take them out to a warm meal um, and we show up with a welcome home backpack. And those come filled with um, basic essentials and also a prepaid cell phone that has our phone number and important contact information pre-programmed inside. And then we also have this post-release support. So each participant gets paired up with a reentry coordinator. And this reentry coordinator supports their reentry from navigating systems to emotional support 
to even just bringing them out to nature um, and connecting over a hike. So I want to shift back again to Arnold and Sol um, to share more about our reentry work. Um, Arnold, as someone who has experienced reentry firsthand, and also as a core member of our reentry team, what is it about IGP's reentry support model that stands out to you? You know, the, the Inside Garden program uh, certainly is unique uh, in that we are in it for the long haul. Uh, being formerly incarcerated, you know, before I went in as that early caterpillar being destructive and eating away plants and, and, and then going into the prison as my cocoon, where I, I turn myself into this big old mushy, taking myself apart and looking at myself uh, and going to these programs that, that were being offered within the prisons. They were, I found them all to be similar in that they were very just cold, They're just from A to Z. They just go from, if it's a four week program, that's all it is. You start, you stop, you get your certificate, you're done. They get the next uh, group of uh, participants for their program and they continue to whatever it is, eight weeks, six weeks, whatever the program entails. And even there's programs out here that do re-entry work. They, they do gate pickups, but that's what they do. They just go pick up at the gate, drop you off. That's it. Bye-bye. Good luck. Uh, and then there are other programs that uh, help out with employment. So they dig and they do beautiful jobs. They'll find employment for the individuals. And then, but that's it. They find you a job. They go on to the next person. Uh, no more connection. Uh, and whatever case is, where, as opposed to a, the Inside Garden program, we build a relationship. Yeah, we're in there for a year. We have four different arcs with 12 uh, weeks per arc and it's a 48 week program. Uh, in this year that we're with them, uh, we, we get to know each other uh, from the inside out. Uh, it's an inner and outer gardening program. And in working within uh, each other and, and, we, and we share, we share, you know, what we know what, uh, well, being in there, I know what uh, life is about in there. And, uh, and so I'm able to relate and they're able to relate to me as well. Uh, as we build a relationship, we do pick them up the gate. And uh, as Karen was saying, uh, we do provide a warm breakfast. Uh, it's a familiar face when they are released and they see one of the re-entry coordinators, uh, such as myself. And I had already been with them for a whole year. They see me, I pick them up, we go have breakfast. Uh, we take them to their transitional home or their own personal home or wherever they're supposed to reside. Uh, we keep in contact with them. We have a circles group every Thursday night where people from all throughout California, we're all connected uh, from Southern California, to Northern California, to the Bay Area, to Humboldt, to wherever they're at. And we all connect on Thursday nights and we share our, our anxieties, our experiences, our great times that we're having, uh, what's, to, what's expected. Uh, and then we also have this uh, lifer coaching that uh, we are working on for lifers who are recently being found suitable for release. Uh, we write letters to them uh, through JPay, and we let them know what's to be expected when they come out here. Uh, being in prison for 25 years, I had, uh, when you hear a buzzer, you hit the floor. It's an alarm. Something's happening on the yard. Uh, and I let them know that when you come out, be mindful of that. Uh, my personal experience with a buzzer was when I was walking through the school and uh, I was walking by the gym area and I heard a, a buzzer. So what did Arnold do? Of course, Arnold just programmed it's, uh, and I hit the floor. Uh, of course, I regained my composure and as the students are walking by looking at me like, and then I start untying my shoe and pretend that that's what I was trying to do. And uh, it turns out that there's a swimming pool right where I was walking and they hit the buzzer so the swimmers can take a dive. And uh, so condition response, you know, I, I, I'm letting the lifers that are going to be soon released, let them know that you don't have to hit the floor anymore. Uh, there's things that we uh, definitely need someone who is out here uh, and guiding them, especially even going to the store. Uh, in prison, there's a canteen where you have a, a list of items that are being sold in the canteen, but you don't actually walk inside. It's just a, a slip of paper. You put down the quantity of whatever they're offering, like tuna. I put down five cans, uh, slip my paper through the window. They kick out five cans, and that's the extent. Uh, out here, you go to the store, and I'm in front of this tuna aisle, and then there's all kinds of different kinds of tuna. There's big cans, small cans, round cans, square cans, uh, 
tuna in oil, tuna in, in salt water, tuna in fresh water, tuna. And they just, I just want a can of tuna, you know? So you need, uh, you know, we need each other to, to help guide us through this and, and prepare us for what's coming out. Uh, and we continue, we continue. We, we don't ever let uh, uh, people just go home without uh, a hand. Uh, they know that they can reach out to us anytime that they need. And uh, there's times that they're gonna be needing us. We've had other successful stories where people were released homeless. And through the Inside Garden program, our reentry team, we've been able to connect them to employment and housing. Uh, one individual was released in Davis and he was homeless, literally living out in the streets. Uh, we were able to uh, find housing for him in another uh, town. And, and the city actually, and he is now working uh, in construction for a union and he's doing very well for himself. And uh, he joins us every Thursday and he's super thankful. Other individuals from the Inside Garden program also who have been released, they created their own programs, gardening programs, and they hire IGP members as we are released because we are all looking for some kind of employment, some money in our pocket. Uh, holistically, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, through phone calls, through texts, through Zooms, through we try to help them out wherever we can. Gift cards if they need it. Uh, we help out with referrals to their uh, uh, California IDs, to their CalFresh, to uh, Medi-Cal. We try to help them out, do whatever it takes to get them going uh, to stabilize their, their, their future. Thanks, Arnold. I think you hit on a couple important pieces, which is... Um, one is the importance of having other people support your reentry who have also gone through it themselves. Like there's so much of that nuance that I think only someone who has experienced it themselves could really understand and help provide guidance around. I think the other thing too is I've heard this from um, some participants before they come home is this kind of anxiety around, you know, the there's so much transformation that happens inside of prisons. And often people's like families and loved ones don't get to witness that whole growth. Um, you know, they know, they know the person that was there before. And so to have someone be able to be that, to see, see them on both sides, to witness the growth that happens inside the prison and to be there for them and know them when they come home, I um, think is, is important as well. So I know you talked a little bit about this already around how IGP supported your reentry. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share about kind of what you thought was unique or what surprised you about the reentry support you got from IGP? Um, to me, it's like how IGP supports you in like a, in a whole like all the way around. You know, like I'm I'm really I got released in December and I'm still involved with IGP. Um, they still call me and check on me. Like I, I, you know, I attend the support groups, like, um, like we, in the support groups, we, we share, we talk about things like that we're struggling with or things that we reach goals. Um, you know, we meditate, we, we, you know, even though we are doing it through Zoom, um, uh, mm -hmm. we do, uh, we drink tea together at the same time. So we, you know, like, uh, like we just check on each other and we support each other. And um, that's what's amazing. Like, I, I feel like IGP is part of my family because they have been there for me and uh, since I met them. And, you know, it's just amazing how um, a program um, can be so unique because I never, I never uh, experienced anything else like it. You know, um, from working inside, like learning different skills. Like I learned how to design a garden in prison I, and through IGP. I learned how to do um, installing uh, all like the water, everything. Like, it, like just, you know, it's just like to me, it's very emotion. Like it brings a lot of emotions because um, they have helped me so much and I have learned so much in their program. And what I, one of the things that I really like that, um, that I kind of mentioned earlier, um, IGP brings different organizations in to, to share about their resources, their job opportunities, like even college professors come in and speak and like learning about aquaponics and 
learning about like aquaponics, different types of soil, like um, different types of um, like, uh, like uh, we even had like a lady that, uh, that brought all these different insects and she was telling us all these different, um, I really love that, you know, like all these different functions that they have in the garden and all this stuff, things that I never imagined, like that I never heard in my life. It, it really felt like a college class too, like a college class slash um, self-help group slash uh, job training um, program, everything. It has everything. Like I can't even begin. Like I feel so grateful to be part of this program and I feel, um, I feel so uh, like, how do you call it? Like I feel that I'm blessed to have this program in my life because it has helped me so much. And I never imagined, uh, you know, when I joined uh, the garden program, seeing these people working in the garden, I never imagined that it, w it was more than that. It was more than getting a shovel and taking dirt around and like, or planning something It's more than that. And, um, and, you know, like, I feel like a lot of a lot of us in um, in people that are incarcerated have benefited so much from this program. Thank you, Sol. Um, I mean, you you say that it, it kind of makes you emotional. It also makes me emotional to hear it because I think what you talk about around like IGP being a family, it really is because our program is like so rooted around building relationships and connecting with each other. So thank you. Um, I wanted to share that we are, we've kind of as an organization gone through our own transformation over the past year. Um, I'm sure for lots of other people, this whole like experience of going through COVID, it has just opened up new, um, new ways of thinking and actually some new and exciting pathways for us. So we're beginning to dream about our future and we wanted to share some of those dreams with you all. The first thing we're thinking about is wanting participants to be able to come back um, to the community with something tangible after being through our program. So something that they maybe could use towards higher education or employment, like a permaculture certificate or even a college credit. The next piece is developing a citizen science component into our curriculum. Uh, we see the opportunity for our gardens to be like living labs or living classrooms where participants could be contributing to scientific research by collecting data on things like pollinators, insects, um, and even how our gardens have impacted the biodiversity of the prisons. We're also dreaming of an IGP community farm or a nursery. So we're envisioning a place that could both generate income, produce food for the local community, and also provide employment and job training to participants in reentry. And then on the reentry side, we're also dreaming about ways we can deepen our work. Uh, Arnold mentioned this earlier, but we're working on um, providing pre-release lifer coaching to folks who were serving life sentences and are now paroling. So these participants will be paired up with a reentry coordinator who was also a former lifer, uh, who will help them navigate the emotional process of re-entering after such a long time away. Harvesting Reentry Insights is a storytelling project that we are developing to share some of the more nuanced challenges to re-entry. So we're working with past participants and formerly incarcerated staff to document their experiences on different re-entry themes like reuniting with their children, or going grocery shopping for the first time. And then lastly, we are also exploring how we might build in a restorative justice component into our reentry work. So for many, the healing journey begins inside and we're finding ways to help folks continue that important work when they come home. So um, I wanted to leave time for questions. And I also wanted to just offer that the packets we've been sending in during COVID, um, we'd be happy to share those with anyone that's interested. Um, 
we've kind of been sharing them far and wide to, to groups that have been asking. So we know that they've been shared in um, facilities in Indiana and I think some, some in Florida and Georgia. Margo from Insight Garden Program. I know you were helping us track some of the questions. I wonder if I could pull you in to see if you flagged any that came in. Yeah, um, the first few questions were really about are the packets available? So thank you for naming that. Um, and if folks want to get access to those, they can email info at insightgardenprogram.org. Someone else, Ariel, has asked, I'm very curious how big your staff is to accommodate all this amazing reentry work in addition to the in-prison virtual garden work. Is there overlap? Also curious about the lines of communication you have to find out about students' release dates. Um, are they with students themselves, their families, their lawyers, staff at the prison, all of the above, and curious about our relationship with California Corrections. Okay, thanks. Um, I can try answering some and then Arnold, if you wanna jump in with anything else. Um, I wish I could think off the top of my head how many staff we have, but we do have um, a reentry team that has four reentry coordinators. Um, three reentry coordinators and one reentry manager. We also have other folks on that team that help support, you know, just the general management, the tracking, the logistics, even processing mail that comes through. And then we have um, a staff of program managers. There's a little bit of overlap. Some program managers work at three facilities, some just work at one. Um, and so we have that team working on building this correspondence version of our curriculum, helping to revise our in-person curriculum, and they're, they're working with volunteers to respond to all the letters that are coming in. When it comes to the release date information, this is really what our reentry team works on. Um, in California, the Department of Corrections actually has a, a website where you can type in someone's CDC number and kind of get their status in regards to release date. Um, that information is not totally perfect. So we use that as a basis for tracking um, when people are expected to go to the parole board. That's when we know let's reach out by letter um, to offer you know, support around prepping for the parole board or writing a letter of support for them and starting the reentry planning process. We also are, um, have over time built up relationships with the staff at the prisons. Um, and so we're creating direct lines of communication between, um, I think they're called parole success advocates or agents um, to really get all the details around someone's release date and where are they going? How can we um, support and you know provide logistics around finding housing to even transporting them to their transitional home. Margo, can I turn back to you to see if there's other questions? Yes. Um, question about the logistics of correspondence offerings. Are the packets self-paced, interactive, drop or uh, interaction via post or drop-offs? What's the frequency? of responses and interactions? Does participation mirror in-person programming? These are our excellent questions. And so for the audience, Margot has also helped us really kind of spearhead this whole initiative around um, doing the correspondence. So Margot, no pressure, but do you wanna answer some of these? Sure, yeah, um, I can give you a rough overview. So we're sending in these packets once a month. They're about 20 pages long, um, typically. And we include, we basically have adapted our lesson plans. We squeeze about three of our in-person lesson plans into one packet. And we include a bunch of content information about permaculture, the gardens, um, insects, pollinators, all kinds of different information. 
and we splice in interactive activities, journal responses, reflections, um, and at the end we have these worksheets or activities where folks are filling out their portion, engaging with the content, and then mailing that back to us, and we provide feedback on the work that they've done. And yeah, I think that was most of the questions. We, we send them all via post. We occasionally will drop off a box of supplies at the prison, but we have no in-person contact with the participants. It's all via mail. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Margo. I'm seeing this question from Federica that I wonder, Arnold and Sol, if you want to answer. And so the question is, um, do you feel, do you reckon participating in programs ameliorates the relationship between inmates and the prison personnel? So I guess in other words, do you feel like being a part of Insight Garden Program helps to, um, you know, does it do anything with the relationship between people who are incarcerated and prison staff? Oh, you know, you know, if I can answer that one, uh, and only through witness, uh, I have seen, there's no conversation between the correctional officers and those who are currently incarcerated. Uh, however, the gardening brings a conversation uh, to them because they've all had the same experience. It doesn't matter your background, socioeconomically or uh, religious or race or anything else. Gardening just brings people together. And uh, the officers also are curious about, you know, hey, how did you get that to grow in barren dirt? I mean, Avenal is in the desert. I mean, it feels like it's the desert. There's just nothing out there but lizards and, uh, and hawks. And, uh, and to see the interaction there, uh, there was some officer who obviously didn't feel that it was going to be a success. Uh, they, they were really negative towards the program. Uh, they said that, uh, that the people that are inside, they're going to just tear up the, 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 the they're going to steal the plants. They're going to uh, uh, just ruin uh, the garden. And it was totally the opposite. And as a result of that, they really uh, praise the, pro the program and they see the connection, how people are starting to get together and, and talk about it. They'll stand outside the gate of the, of the garden and they're just looking inside for those who cannot go inside the program that are not in the program yet, just yet. And uh, we have a waiting list, like over hundred people who want to get into the program. And the officers, certainly, you bet there is a connection there. I mean, they, they all talk about it. They talk about the pollinators that come in and now there's bees out there. There's birds out there there's more than just the hawks uh of, of course uh, squirrels are always a problem there but uh, uh because they get their little feet on uh on the garden but you know they're just part of nature that we all deal with and we learn to live with yeah so to answer the question directly yes absolutely there is a connection there uh, can i jump in on that yes please okay so as a formal um as a alumni um I could see that um, some, you know, we're not always going to have staff that they're all going to agree of us having programs in the prison, especially a garden program. We have had, so, um, I experienced having some negative feedback from some staff where they're like, oh, why are you guys having a garden program? You guys are just going to hide things there and all that stuff. But then when uh, when they start seeing how um, how beautiful it looks, how we're building the garden from scratch, how we're designing the garden and everything, they start asking questions. They start getting curious. Like I've had staff ask me, like, "How did you guys come up with the design?" And I said, "Well, we uh, we all came together. We all drew um, the pl the plot and the you know the blueprints, and we all voted on what." we thought that looked better and and we all came uh came up with we put our designs together and they're like you guys can do that and we're like yeah that's how that you know that's how we learn how to do garden design and then how we incorporated everybody's design and um how we all came together and incorporated together and they're like oh that's cool and then when especially when the pandemic hit and we couldn't go out there and the weeds grew like 10 feet tall um, and then, and then I was able to go out there. They're like, "Oh my God, that garden needs to be clean." And and when I started cleaning it, and all the weeds disappear, and it came back to being the beautiful garden that it was. They're like, "Oh my God, you guys are doing a good job. Now it looks really beautiful." You know, like I'm glad that you guys did that because I like to watch it. I like to look at it, and you know, when I'm sitting out here. So that's how you know. That's how you kind of like get them to start like. Um, 
you know, being involved with this. And then I had other staff that were in favor of it. And they were like, hey, you're part of the Inside Garden program. Can you can you help me? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, can you get a group together and like kind of fix the garden in front of our unit and all that stuff? So we were able to get uh, staff to be involved too. And uh, um, so, but you know, that's how we're not always gonna have uh, uh, support, you know, but then when they see what we're doing, they kind of put their guard down and they start you know, seeing what we're doing and the beauty of it. Does that make yeah. any sense? Completely, yeah. completely. Arnold, were you going to add something else? No, I mean, that's just beautifully put. Uh, yes, so the question, uh, the answer to the question is yes, absolutely. There is a, uh, we can uh, ameliorate their, their uh, a connection with the staff and, and the people who are currently incarcerated. Yeah, I think that was the other part I was going to add. It's like it, it kind of just ameliorates the relationship with everybody, right? Like, again, everybody can connect with nature and transforming the literal landscape actually does shift something when people can actually see growth occurring and colors and new animals, new insects arrive. It does something to the environment. Yeah, you know, uh, Karen, uh, uh, to add to the your, your correspondence courses, you know, we haven't forgotten about the people that are inside, even though we're not allowed to go inside, we have not forgotten about our participants. And that's what the uh, a huge part of the correspondence courses that the uh, our developmental uh, team is is uh, implementing. I mean, we're still connecting with the people and, and we're letting you know that, hey, we're still here. We have not abandoned you. Uh, and that's what we all need that. Uh, and, you know, our program is, is uh, we do practice meditation, uh, uh, constantly and it's not all about putting your nose to the grinding stone there is uh there's time for self-care and we have to and we emphasize that a lot uh, even when we come out here uh, in our re-entry team we take our uh, participants out on hiking trips uh, just let your mind expand and get and connect with nature we've taken them out to sequoia national park uh, to three rivers uh, and in the future we are also planning on camping trips or retreats uh, with our participants uh, just to show them that there's more to life than just your prison prison and neighborhood. I mean, and a lot of these people that are inside, that's all they know is prison and their neighborhood, neighborhood and the prison, neighborhood. And that's all they know. And when we show them that there's more to life than just that, it just really connects, uh, a connecting factor between ourselves, our community, and our natural environment. Thanks, Arnold. When you touched on the correspondence piece, it also reminded me um, back to this question from Joshua around like, does participation mirror in-person programming? Um, we have tried to retain some of those core pieces of our in-person program, which is that mindfulness piece, right? So we begin every class with meditation. We begin every packet with a meditation as well. Um, we also have a lot of sort of what we call like the inner gardening piece. We have like reflective questions, journaling prompts. Um, and something we're just starting to develop right now is uh, something we've heard about, you know, back when we were going in into the prisons was the desire to share what they were learning with family members. And so something we are starting to develop now through correspondence are additional activities that go with these packets that people can then send off to their families so that they can do some sort of correspondence activity that mirrors what they're doing um, on their own. So we have one last question that might be a good note to end on for our last two minutes here, which is just about our expansion and our work in other states. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about th how the program works in other locations and how folks can get involved with us. Sure, yeah. So I think um, as you all could see like early on the presentation, we've grown a lot since 2014, mostly in California. Uh, we did expand to Indiana and Ohio, and those two happened to happen because um, we spoke to the DOC in both of those states. Um, and so they were interested in doing a pilot program. Both have different ways of funding the program. Um, we are definitely interested in expanding and we're interested in doing it thoughtfully. Um, so that we are able to retain like the, the quality of our program, 
um, the like the deepness that we go and um, so that we are also conscious of our staff capacity. But please, if you're interested in um, learning more about like possibility about replicating or learning about our kind of model, you can always email us. Um, I think the email's in the chat or it's on the slide here as well, info at insightgardenprogram.org. Great, well, thank you so much um, to the three of you um, for this uh, really engaging and, and thorough presentation on a lot of ways. Um, and so at this point, uh, we're going to take uh, a 15 minute break and so if you could, um, please, you can, we're gonna keep the stream going so you can um, stay logged in, um, but we're gonna take a 15 minute break uh, at 2.15 uh, sharp, right on the dot, we'll be starting um, with our next presentation. So do be sure um, you're, you're back in time for that, but please do take a stretch break. You'll, now also keep in mind, um, we uh, will be posting again at the start of the next session, the um, networking page where you can leave your contact information uh, for to get in touch with other participants or presenters, but also um, <clears throat> the folks from the Insight Garden program here have put their contact information here to follow up with them directly as well. But um, uh, so we will see you in uh, exactly 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Okay, so welcome back everyone or welcome um, to the conference if you're just joining us. Uh, you will find in the chat uh, the link to full program for the conference and to speaker bios. Uh, we will note here that we are not reading the whole bios um, and hope that you'll learn more um, about um, the backgrounds of our speakers by visiting the link. Uh, and <clears throat> the other thing to bring your attention to is the um, conference networking page, which we all periodically throughout the session or at some point in the session be posting uh, to the chat, uh, which is where you can put your contact information if you would like to get in touch with other participants or presenters. Um, so uh, not uh, anything further. Um, we're <laughs> headed into our second um, session of the day here, the Conference on Social and Ecological Infrastructure for Recidivism Reduction. On uh, our next presentation, uh, which will go from 2.15 to 3.15 p.m. Eastern time, is Restoration, Not Incarceration, Lessons Learned from an Ecological Rehabilitation Program for the Formerly Incarcerated. And <clears throat> we have with us uh, as presenters, Christine Norton, who is Associate Professor of Social Work at Texas State University and Jarid Manos, who is a writer and founder of the Great Plains Restoration Council. So thank you both for joining us um, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm the founder of Great Plains Restoration Council. And um, a long time ago, like I had a, I thought I had AIDS. And so I had this crazy idea. This was back in the time when it was like a death sentence. So I thought I would, I decided that I was gonna drive myself across the country and go get tested and, and, um, and get my bad results and then starve myself to death in the desert. <laughs> but um, on the way there, I, as I was looking out, I was, going across the middle part of the country and my eyes and my spirit just kept on looking out there and I was saying, what is out there? And I made a promise that I would do something more with my life if, my, if I didn't have what we call the bonus back then. And so when I tested negative, then I um, committed my life to uh, getting myself back together. And, and so 
that began a process, first of all, for me to try to understand what the Great Plains was. And you ask why, but it's open country and it has a place of calling you out there. And so this is what I thought first. I thought I would, would see, you know, America's lost grassland Eden, this place of beauty and peace that you could go out there and you'd see wild and the wild and just at last be at a place of peace. But what instead over a period of years, you know, I um, found a, a, a deeper story of American violence and um, it actually traumatized me. And I spent many years, you know, uh, trying to uh, reconcile that. And I realized that, you know, all I saw was, you know, it, it was a far worse war zone than anything else I had ever known. And so, you know, whether it was a killing of, you know, not just historically of Buffalo or Indian people or prairie dogs, but um, just, you know, you know, in current day, you know, there's a lot of things that happen out there in the West that people don't know about. So uh, even outside of Yellowstone National Park, when the Buffalo try to come out, they are uh, shot and there's prairie dog killing contests. So it was, it took me a long time to deal with that. And finally, once I survived my own life, I said, what else is there for me to do but give back? And I decided, I looked back to my original promise and I said, well, I'm gonna create a nonprofit that helps people take care of their own lives to taking care of our, our earth and wild animals and, and wildlife. Um, the earth is not just an object. Wildlife has, the, the animals out there have their own story stories. And so I thought that why not do something that helps people heal themselves through healing the earth and that place that you fly over what people call flyover country may, um, very few people probably have ever hiked in it or paid attention to it, probably because mostly it's been destroyed, most of it, but paradoxically it offers itself uh, as out of the ashes a place for a new model of healing, um, people taking care of their own lives to taking care of the earth. So we got some funding and we created this ecological health model. Let's see if I can get it. You know, based out of the idea that the violence we do to the earth mirrors the violence we do to each other and often accept them to ourselves. So out of, out of um, that practicality, we, created Restoration Not Incarceration, Plains Youth Interaction, Interaction in Your Health Outdoors. And we, in the coastal prairie of uh, Houston, Texas, there all the way down the coast, there's less than 1% left. This was the year where some in the Southern Plains, some of the first uh, settlement uh, came. And in partnership with Pastor Rudy and St. John's downtown and the Bread of Life Homeless Shelter, we piloted this project where uh, we, we had a, um, this was a book that Dr. Norton wrote about, but basically we would restore the prairie. And when we first started, it was just filled with invasives like Chinese tallow and, and uh, all these vines and poison ivy and things like that. And so through the work of going out there, we looked at from a bloodstreams and creeks approach, we looked at how the body and our own lives uh, worked in a state of wellness or disease, and this is going kind of quick. So um, wait, I'm, I'm trying to get to the other side. Here it is. But um, sorry, I'm getting used to this PowerPoint. But even, even when um, as a lot of the young folks we selected first from the homeless shelter, they were colleague referred. And it's a lot of work, but using work in nature, not just as busy work, but actually providing refuge, breathing life back out into the land has proven to be very effective. And a lot of times we're so constricted, just like all those invasives and, and vines and thorns tearing at the, the prairie, it's many things in our lives are like that as well. So we work in a parallel process of getting uh, through that. Here we built a wetland that there used to be pocket prairie wetlands and you can see like how after, what's amazing is that even you know literally 15 minutes after we filled it up with water we started seeing wildlife like you know crawfish or dragonflies or even some hummingbirds coming around so there's like it was another model of, of how the earth wants to to 
has the vitality within itself to breathe if we help it along. And you can see how, how that wetland and the open prairie, prairie started. So um, there's a lot of, you know, in, in the space about uh, uh, using the eco ecological work, I think particularly uh, there's a lot of times that the natural world itself and the living, breathing ecosystems that give us all life and the animals who live there is not in included as much in that conversation. And that's why we're using the prairie particularly as a, a model for that rebirth. You will see some of the ecosystem services that they provide for people. You can see the difference here of the, the native prairie grass, the tall grass, so much of their roots will hold the water in, in, in increasing storm events. And then, but where you, you probably heard that uh, Houston was built on a swamp, but it wasn't a swamp until people took out and destroyed the coastal prairie and then it became a muddy place. So you can utilize some of these things uh, for uh, ecosystem services that provide multiple benefits for people and, and, and wildlife. Um, and we had it donated. Uh, one of the themes we talk about is, is the mind that makes the body. And you're gonna have a lot of times people who have a lot of uh, issues and it's important to for, for restoration, not incarceration and ecological health in general, it's important to pair um, restoration ecology with social work so one helps the other and then we can fill the prescriptions in the, the, um, in the field. One of the other projects we did out there, as you know, I, I love Prairie Dog, was helping restore a Prairie Dog town. And when we were out there, this, this is an area where they had been poisoning and gas and shot out of the landscape. So what we did, we had to reconstruct in this, you're about maybe 5,000, 5,500 feet in the in elevation. And we had to reconstruct starter burrows and it's a, it's a long process. But when we were out there, then we re reintroduced them in the back into the wild, and that prairie dog town is still existing uh, now. And once once it was done, they were able to self-sustain. How our work started was through the Fort Worth Prairie Park, and this was one of the areas that had it was an effort to save what one of the last tracks of ten thousand year old native prairie. So we worked through. Uh, it was an amazing, beautiful place that I had seen after I come across after you know, a landscape of uh, total devastation. And so we worked very hard to save this. It was uh, public land, but it was in danger of being sold for development. And as you see, it was perfect. And we, we worked, we first started with youth who again had um, some comorbidity challenges, uh, partnered with AIDS Outreach Center and other organizations. And through that process, we even reintroduced wild bison into the area. And they lived many years out there and it was, it was the, even a uh, national stopover for the monarch butterfly and grassland nesting bird uh, um, migration. So through that, you know, people always looked at the, the, the earth as something that was just there rather than something that was part of our own flesh and blood, culture and soul. And we, this has become the epicenter project for us to uh, teach ecological health. Um, nationwide. And we had a tragedy happen that taught us a lot about uh, that res resiliency and stamina and perseverance when the state sold it. So they sold it for development. And so we had to start all over again. And even through our youth work, we, we had youth summits with um, our satellite organization from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, our Oglala Lakota youth. And we continue to work on it. So now where we're at, we're rebuilding back up to an area in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers and others. And if you see here, this area has some uh, overgrowth uh, from woody ve vegetation. Because in the historic absence of buffalo and bison and fire, the, some of that has come up to, to choke the prairie. So we're out there working it and bringing it back to 1800s conditions. This work, you know, with, you may have heard about um, the 30 by 30, the global push to preserve uh, and protect 30% of 
Earth's lands and ocean waters by 2030 with an ultimate goal of 50 by 2050. And President Biden has just signed on to committee towards that. These are some of the ways where their society and can produce multiple benefits by employing people, uh, working at uh, different ways for uh, criminal justice reform and, and low level offenders, community service, uh, or and particularly re-entry for uh, young people in particular to uh, emerge back into society. And we use a lot, a lot of the work that we do out there again is, is about providing refuge for those. And we, have a, we definitely have a lot of solidarity for those who are out there trying to express their lives and uh, one of our main things is by taking care of others, we take care of ourselves. And a lot of it is really hard work, but that's, that's part of the value of it. And so we're a big advocate. We think people, A, need to be paid. Uh, $100 a day can go a long way when you're in transition coming, coming out of the system. And the, then you provide those multiple ecosystem services. You're protecting wildlife, you're improving air, you're improving water quality, you're improving just general health of other people. And the work itself has been shown uh, to be a track way towards uh, um, recidivism reduction. And Dr. Christine Norton will get into some more of those studies later. But so we've lately now involved, to, uh, uh, we've, as it's grown, We've taught it in other places and we've worked, uh, we've uh, expanded to uh, shark therapy, which is pretty cool because sharks and many of us, a lot of us feel like we're constantly stereotyped and seen as a danger. So now through a partnership with uh, Gangster to Growers and West Atlanta Watershed Alliance in Atlanta and my organization in Shark Addicts Diving, we have expanded to utilize the same project to help uh, protect sharks in the ocean from such as uh, shark finning. Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, uh, introduced a bill that got a lot of support last year to uh, to uh, ban shark finning sales, which, as you know, 100 million sharks are killed e each year, and we're trying to support that. It didn't pass, but uh, you see that there, most of the sharks that we run into are, are injured, have been and hooks and all kinds of things like that. So utilizing this work again is an, an entryway for, this is the captain in front of shark addicts diving. But this, this type of work, again, allows us not to be passive to all the collapse and uh, the violence and the destruction and a lot of times the hopelessness that a lot of us feel towards uh, what's happening with our present uh, world. Um, and so how it works is, the ecosystem project, this is through the life wheel, is, is, is the axle wherever that is, whether it's the prairie or um, the ocean or Atlanta, West Atlanta watershed, or even Queensland, Australia, they're, they're doing a project out there. And then over a period of over three tiers, we teach these, these spokes here that lead out to more of a life. And, um, and one of the things that's really important, I found that I like to stress is, uh, the shatter moment that a lot of our young men particularly have where you feel like, you, you know, you um, you can't breathe, so, so, many, so, many, so many things are happening to it, you, you, you react and you don't have the tensility to navigate that shatter moment where you lash out and you hear others or, or yourself or both at the same time. This ecological work out there and repairing the natural world and your, your own flesh and blood and soul as part of that helps you build more of that reservoir of, uh, we're all stronger than we think we are and processing through those, um, those shattered moments. And so with, we're in the middle of a extinction crisis, as you know, and a lot of times it feels like there is uh, little, little hope, but we take a lot of inspiration, like this guy flown maybe a thousand miles to get here and he just landed on my fingers we take a lot of inspiration from how much um, the animals in the natural world are trying to uh, be there for us and, and tell us a few things that, that can possibly be the open door for our, for our future. So that's the, the background of it. And then I'll pass it on over to uh, um, Dr. Christine Norton. 
Thanks, Tarid. A couple questions before uh, I go over some of the research that we were able to do on restoration, not incarceration. Um, Leah asked, made a comment, first of all, that this is beautiful intersectional work and asked how it's funded. Would you like to just speak to that briefly before we move on? Um, Everyone wants to know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> plus, tears, hard work, collaboration economy. You know, one of the things that we found, uh, uh, private individuals have been a much, uh, we had a few angels, uh, some, um, some grants, but most of our funding, we do a combination of, of uh, uh, work to be support. A lot of times, you know, I'll be honest with you, um, some, particularly when you have new work and particularly work that may uh, be among uh, environmental work that's of communities of color, it, it's not always as funded as much as other places, but we found that we do best what we do and then we collaborate with others. That's one way we can do a million dollars worth of work on, you know, a quarter or a third of that budget. So we'll do our part and then we'll partner with others uh, who all have expertise in that. And, and then we continue to build the relationships. I do, we, we are looking to establish a restoration, not incarceration work scholarship fund uh, that we would like to provide you know, and, and as we expand and let other, teach other people how to adapt and adapt this, we can provide that funding for, say, an a agency or a nonprofit in some other part of the country wanting to do that for their own ecosystem. We could uh, fill in that gap and say, well, you hire formerly incarcerated young men and women and come out to work, and we'll pay that, that part. So um, it's a combination, yeah. grants, individuals, uh, and collaboration. And then that's the perfect segue because the, the other thing written in the chat that I wanted to invite you to speak to, Laura wrote, this is so amazing. She said she works with the Institute for Critical Animal Studies, which does a lot of prison abolition work in addition to animal liberation work. And so maybe there's a future combination there, um, collaboration there, excuse me, uh, for how her organization can partner with you. So I'll make sure to save the chat, Jareed, and we can keep, keep these conversations going. I think that you're right. There are so many people doing things that are really amazing and it gets really siloed. And I think our strength will be found in, in collaborating. So Laura, hopefully you and Jareed can, can contact each other after this. Well, thank you. Um, you're not done. I'm gonna bring you back in as I'm presenting because I think you bring the, the mojo, you bring the inspiration. <laughs> You know, and so I, I'll introduce myself and talk about our partnership. I'm Christine Norton, and um, Jerry, would you mind stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah and I'll me. pull my my slides up. Not no tech person there. Okay. And we're all good. We're all good. Yeah. So I'm a social work professor at Texas State University, which is in Central Texas, in the Hill Country uh, region. Just try that again. Can you all see? Can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for that. Um, and I had the privilege of, you know, just living in Texas. Uh, Jerry, call me up and tell me about this program. I am a research scientist with the Outdoor Behavioral Healthcare Center, which is based out of uh, the University of New Hampshire. But there are seven of us around the country who are research scientists that try to build our body of work around research looking at outdoor behavioral health care, which is kind of broadly defined as mental health interventions that intentionally um, partner with the natural world to promote um, health and well-being. And, and that looks at you know some kind of outdoor adventure-based interventions, but also some more ecotherapy type interventions. And so when Jareed contacted me and told me about this program and asked, would I be willing to, um, you know, just donate my time to get involved, to learn more about it, and then also conduct some preliminary research, knowing that this was a pilot program. Um, the Great Plains Restoration Council has done a lot of, a lot of different kinds of work on this spectrum. I mean, we know about the school to prison pipeline. So anything 
uh, I believe that Great Plains Restoration Council is doing with youth uh, around positive youth development and this ecological health for me is a way of, it's prevention, it's prevention work. This particular program was really looking at helping with re-entry. And so it, it wasn't the main focus of the Great Plains Restoration Council, but to read, you are someone who jumps on an opportunity and works really hard. And so um, this opportunity came up. And so as you can see, right, this was a pilot and we refer to it as an eco-social work program. And I loved um, in the presentation that just went before us, I was, I was so excited. Uh, hearing about that combination again of social work and then this ecological and human restoration work kind of um, coming together, right? With the goal of using land restoration, but also psychosocial group work, case management and advocacy. So I was on board and I, I remember I actually um, drove down to Houston to be able to uh, um, meet with the participants and then gather some data and collect some data in a really grassroots manner. And I say that pun intended, I'm sorry, it's bad humor, but I do, I remember sitting in, uh, sitting on in the dirt on the ground, which is kind of my happy place and talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, one thing I, I wanna highlight, um, hang on, I'm trying to find our video again, there we go. One thing I'm trying, I want to highlight is, um, you know, was it Laura? No, it was um, Leah commented on the intersectional uh, aspects of this work and what we're addressing, what's being addressed are a host of things, right? We're looking at social and racial justice. Uh, we're looking at really big societal wounds both to the land and to marginalized communities, the people who, you know, Jareed and I were talking about this, you know, the way that there are a group of people in the prison population that are seen as like throwaway people. And then there's land that's considered throwaway land, don't think about it, develop it, dump on it. And this, this again, this parallel process that's happening of reducing recidivism, but also ecological degradation and promoting healing of people and land. This is a public health imperative. It's a public health strategy. Even with the organizations like the Student Conservation Corps, they've totally changed their motto to go to, to become transforming lives and lands. It's not one or the other, it's both. That's the intersectional nature of this work. So I, I was really honored to be a part of it. And I was honored also to build, I think some of those trusting relationships as I gathered some of that really beautiful qualitative data from a very small and very powerful group of folks. So again, we know the scope of the problem, right? We know that there is a huge prison population in this country. Um, and we also know that recidivism is a problem, that there's a revolving door because people aren't actually getting opportunities for rehabilitation. And, and even moving past that word, I would like us to move past that word from rehabilitation to refuge and restoration, right? That's what, that's the work. And so we know the problem and all of us that are here at this conference are saying, there has to be a new and better way uh, than what's happening. We have to figure this out. And, and so I'm really thankful to uh, all the folks at Yale and Matthew that have brought us here together um, to just begin having these conversations. Um, when I looked at, it's, it's interesting because I feel like for me, um, I always want to understand as a, as a social work educator and researcher, I always want to understand what best practices should look like. And obviously there's a ton of research that's been done in this area on what are the best practices for recidivism reduction. And so what's interesting is you have program folks like Jareed who intuitively, right, based on really based on firsthand experience, like you had your own encounter with the healing power of nature. Um, and out of that 
really intuitive, intuitive wisdom said, you know, I want to offer this back. I want to give this back to other people. And for me, again, when you think about this one, uh, I highlighted a couple that I think uh, R&I, restoration, not incarceration, did really well. This idea of staff attributes. Listen, representation matters. If you had me out there in my work pants, this white, you know, social work lady, that's fine. And we can deal with that and build community, right, uh, across culturally. But to have someone there who has walked in the shoes of participants, who has lived a life, who has experienced racism and has experienced that violence against a people and a land, it matters. And, and in fact, it creates some sustainability challenges, right? Because we've joked that maybe we would try to clone jury, but I, I don't think that's gonna happen, right? So, but what we then have to do is raise up leadership and that's what this program is all about and the program that spoke before that's what's happening this is not about a top-down approach this really is about grassroots development of strengths and capacities so people have the skills to come back and step into those leadership roles so i i loved just really loved the last presentation i want to keep referencing it because it was so great um, I also think one of the strengths of RNI that Jareed talked a little bit about, and I'll go into a bit more, is the, the program's theoretical model of ecological health, to really have a strong theoretical model for these programs that provides these cognitive behavioral and social learning opportunities around something that is holistic is just incredibly important. And then I always feel like co connection, when we think about these interventions, we're trying to re restore people's connections to themselves, to one another, and to the natural world. And so it has to be a, all about building community in the work that we're doing. So again, do we need a rationale? There is a, an empirical rationale for going green. Some of this really started in Washington state with the Sustainable Prisons Project and has really grown from there. There's obviously a lot of research talking about the proven benefits of human contact with nature, both from a physical and behavioral health standpoint. And then just the idea of nature as a therapeutic setting in and of itself um, is, and that, that again, for restoration and refuge, I think the latest research coming out of um, Cornell, Don Rackhouse study was showing the dosage of 10 minutes a day either sitting or walking or gardening <laughs> uh, it, in nature is enough to dramatically reduce some of those symptoms of depression and anxiety. So, and we're not talking about national parks, we're talking about cultivating a love and a connection to nearby nature. This park that was restored through restoration and, and incarceration, I mean, it was just a little plot of land in the middle of a community in Houston. But one of the things, and when I get into the qualitative data, I'll mention is one of the sources of pride of restoring nearby nature for folks who are formerly incarcerated is that they can drive past that piece of land and they can show their kids and they say, hey, look at that, your dad or your mom, I did that. See how that, that new grass is growing up, see those flowers? And they may never have had anything they felt proud of talking to their kids about. And now there's this place that they have literally brought back to life in their community that they can show and share with people in their community as a, really a source of giving back, almost like in a restorative way. So this, when I was doing the research for this project, um, I was, I got really excited. I found this article. It's an older article in a conservation biology journal. What is a social worker doing reading a conservation biology journal? I don't know, but I found this and it's the reciprocal restoration model. And it is the most beautiful idea. And I would, this is what we're all talking about. And so my, my encouragement for all of you who, who also kind of geek out on research is like, how do we operationalize this and provide empirical evidence for this in the research that we need to be doing on these programs, right? And this idea is that it integrates essential elements of both ecological and human restoration and aims to increase human commitment to restoration 
by restoring relationships with the environment. So in other words, from a conservation biology perspective, right, we love what we, uh, excuse me, let me say that again, we protect and conserve what we love. And then it's also reciprocal, right? We fall in love with what we protect and conserve. And there's this relationship of stewardship and conservation behaviors and mindsets that grows and builds. But also as we're doing that, as we're developing a deeper empathy for the land and the need to love it. I'm, I mean, love. Most people don't use the word love, but if you hang around with Jareed enough, you, you, he's talking about love, like loving this land. Um, and then that, spills out to right to, to loving people and loving ourselves. And so again, I just find this to be a beautiful theoretical framework for uh, some of our program development that we're talking about. Um, so how did we apply this in the model, right? Jareed already gave you uh, some of the history, but this was in a little more detail, a partnership between Harris County Corrections, a Bread of Life Shelter for people experiencing homelessness, and then St. John's Downtown United Methodist Church. So again, good old grassroots partnerships and collaboration. Um, and for this project, the participants restored a tract of donated land and opened up this new inner city prairie park in Houston that featured restored coastal prairie, two wetlands and a meditation trail. Participants and staff were together four days a week and then met also two times a week uh, for groups, for psychosocial group work to process again, some of that ecological health curriculum over 12 weeks. Again, I cannot underscore the um, importance of the relationship. There was another um, facilitator that worked with Jareed who was a sociologist uh, that helped facilitate the groups and also provide some case management and um, resource and referrals for the participants. She also led the psychosocial group work, which used the ecological health curriculum. And in essence, really the, the techniques uh, in land restoration that were used were the therapeutic um, connection to nature, actually physically working. There was a lot of hard physical work in removing non-native species and planting and digging and uh, really getting in there and getting connected and building community because you're doing it together. Um, and then taking time to reflect on what that meant. And I think that's the piece that helps with the transfer of learning. So you're out in, in, in nature, you're doing this work, you're with these people, um, you're experiencing a range, a full range of human emotion, and then you're getting time in the groups to really process that. Um, the ecological health curriculum, and I'll show you the life wheel that Jareed created again, is defined as the interdependent health of humans, animals, and ecosystems, and is aimed at improving the health of all three interlocking systems, right? So again, self, community, and then in the case of Great Plains, the native prairie ecosystems, and now sharks, which I just love. I'm not sure to read if I'm ready for that, but <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, new best friends. Okay. <laughs> well, but again, like you said so powerfully, confronting those stereotypes, right? The stereotypes that we have about the land and the flora and fauna, and then confronting the stereotypes that are deeply embedded in, especially in the United States, when it comes to issues of race and class and gender, right? The program is designed to confront those things. So just briefly again, um, and we can make this PowerPoint available, but um, this is the life wheel and the group uh, curriculum focused on all of these different aspects around the life wheel. So when I wanted to evaluate this, honestly, I just thought, how can I get as much data as I can? I wanted to interview people. I used some field notes. I interviewed the sociologist. I interviewed Jareed. Um, and then I did some follow-up interviews three months after the program ended. And so I just wanted to share my experience. Um, you know, I, I will say again, I, I'm a certified clinical trauma professional and I would be remiss, uh, and I get a little emotional talking about this, if I did not acknowledge the complex trauma histories of the participants in this program and the complex trauma histories of most folks that are experiencing incarceration. 
And until we begin to um, apply a trauma-informed lens to prison restoration, uh, we're not gonna make any headway because there has to be a focus on trauma recovery. And I'm actually very interested in the role that our time in nature can play uh, in, in terms of healing from trauma. Um, and so I say that because when I came out to the site, to the work site to do these interviews, I had zero relationships with these people. Again, there were racial differences, gender differences, age differences. And I just will share this beautiful little anecdote, but I remember sitting on the ground and Jareed, I don't know if you remember this, but the group was very re reticent to talk to me, to open up, to trust, which makes sense. And there was this stray dog that had been kind of wandering around the site. And he kept kind of wandering around the site. And he was a little menacing looking, you know, he's, he, I wasn't sure, is he safe, is he healthy, whatever. We kept wandering around the site. And finally, I just, you know, it was one of those just instinctive moments. I was like, buddy, come here, you know? And this dog comes over and just flops and lets me just scratch his like flea bitten belly. And as soon as I just... <laughs> really got present in the here and now with my natural environment as a researcher. Okay, this is a goofy story, but I'm scratching this dog's belly totally unselfconsciously. And all of a sudden, everyone in that group just started talking to me and opening up and really sharing their lives with me. And I just underscore how important it is as researchers, as well as practitioners, to really consider how you enter a space and build trust so that you're getting some really rich um, qualitative data. So just some examples of beautiful poetic things people said. Um, being out here, it made me have respect for life. It's just a beautiful thing. One participant said, look, my life is not that different, but I'm different. I'm stronger, I care more. And this is the participant that said, when I drive by here, I think, I've got to show this to my son. One participant said, fixing the land made me feel like I was giving life instead of taking it. And another said, I can't believe life came back to this dead place. I mean, if it can happen here, it can happen to me. That one got me. And that was in particular reference to the, some say crayfish, some say crawfish, depends on where you're from in the country. Uh, in the United States. But really when, uh, Jareed, you showed that picture of the wetlands kind of bubbling up and coming back. And the fact that somehow, again, a, a crayfish emerged uh, was mind blowing to, to the participants. And I will say, I wrote in the chat, um, the use of nature-based interventions really hangs its hat on what is referred to as ecological metaphors. And it's based on a belief that nature is always speaking to us, but we are not accustomed to listening. And so the programs that we create, I believe, really offer for all of us to become uh, better listeners to nature, because there will be those metaphoric, uh, the, the messages, the ecological me messages that come to us. So in terms of internal changes that I um, noticed in my research, a deeper respect for life, the development of empathy, pride in giving back, increased connection to community, openness, spiritual growth and renewal, a sense of purpose and future, enhanced motivation and clearer goals. Because also while working on this program, uh, working on the land, they were also working on their own lives and some of them were applying for jobs or doing job training, certainly getting the life and work skills from this project and then transferring that into other areas. And then in the three month interviews afterwards, other participants just talked about like making better decisions, right? And none of them had reoffended or had uh, or were incarcerated again. They reported taking steps right towards employment and continuing education. Again, that that switch goes on about like, wow, I deserve a future and a healthy future. And I have capacity to contribute to that future, right? Gaining that from the program. 
um, that increased self-esteem and confidence, and then continuing connections to the RNI staff and the larger community are just so important. And so when I think about where we need to go with this, um, I really believe that we need to figure out how to, again, operationalize, implement, and evaluate that historical um, reciprocation, reciprocal restorative model. Um, I think that when we think about what ecological identity is, it's a combination of connection to self, others, and the land, combined with empathy for ourselves, others, and the land. And maybe this will be a successful um, model for community reintegration, which is a really, really tough thing um, to figure out how to do well. So I really believe as former offenders developed a deeper connection to their communities by helping restore the land, they also began to experience that personal restoration. We really, we really saw that happen. And I am, you know, just thrilled again that I got to be a part of this from the perspective of um, a researcher, but I think the conversation that we wanna have with you all, and we have still 15 minutes for questions, um, and I'll let Jareed kind of add on here as well, um, is, is how can we look at building collaborative partnerships with communities, uh, with programmers, um, social workers, researchers, uh, and then policymakers. Right, because this all of this stuff has huge public policy uh, implications. So, with that, I think I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, did I already stop? No, nope, there we go. And just, uh, Jerry, I don't know if there's anything that you in particular wanted to follow up on from my presentation or if we want to open it up to some of the chat and conversations with the, the folks on the call. Oh yeah, that was that was excellent. Thank you for bringing all that uh, to that. I think, you know, one of the, the things I wanted to like to stress is um, that, you know, there's a lot of talk about bringing, you know, passive experience of nature, but our track is, is more of an active. So we're not just being visitors to the natural world, but our, our bodies and our lives are part of the, the realization and the rebirth of that. So it's, it's, I think that it, doing this through work is really important rather than, I mean, there's, a, we already, there's immense benefits of just going out for a hike or for a walk, but when you're out there working, it's a whole additional benefit. Uh, that's therapeutic. And pretty soon then hopefully we start, we become ecosystem participants and we stop seeing as nature out there. But um, it's part of where, you know, even, even, even in the hood, we share on the prairie, you sh still share the same sun, sun, storms, wind, and water. And so you break that separateness. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a, a very important aspect of the work. Uh, anger management, is I'd like to see this really expanded and in, in, uh, uh, proactively for our anger management uh, issues because the work is very geared for that. I think um, you know also the other thing uh, is there's lots of you know again there's lots of restoration work. We're not going to get to you know a sustainable living livable planet uh, and carbon reduction. Uh, you know we can't even. Even the fact of well, obviously we've got to move to a zero emissions economy, uh, but we there's already too much pollutants, um, heat trapping pollutants in the atmosphere already. So so native grasslands are always uh, ignored, but they will sequester carbon out of the atmosphere for up to eight thousand years in their roots. And I can show you photos of just line of black under under a cut bank. So there's plenty of opportunities for us to look at that. I think there was you know there was damage at the, the border. Let's get people back to work. And instead of just doing contracting out ecological uh, restoration, do it through a social work lens. Do it through people. Do it through work. People need to work. You know, this is where you know there was a civilian conservation corps back in the 30s. A lot of it was busy work. Now we're talking about literally saving our own lives by by saving life. So this is is uh, this is where a lot of the uh, uh, restoration conversation works ahead, in my opinion. Do it through people. Do it through work, not just 
contract out to whoever can bid lowest. Yeah. Jareed, you said a couple of things that I wanted to comment on. One, with the comments about the imperatives of the work, right? Com comparing it to the Civilian Conservation Corps and now looking at the kind of um, overwhelming realities of global climate change and the fact that this work is actually life saving, species saving work um, is to me kind of a, a paradigm shift that I'm not sure we've totally made in our in our conservation communities or, or in our, well, in our conservation communities maybe, but in our, in our global thinking around like working in slash with the environment. Um, and it's connected to another thing you said, which is this idea of not seeing ourselves as separate from the natural world, but as ecosystem members. When you said participants, the word member really came up for me. And it, it struck me that my background as a white woman um, of European descent, uh, there's so much implicit bias around having a colonizing mindset which inherently is kind of um, a power over or a us versus them uh, mindset. And you just really kind of gave me a, a little light bulb because I remember hearing about some work coming out of California in the outdoor just um, participation conversation, right? Like how do we get more uh, folks of color participating, recreating, you know, paddling in the outdoors? But the work that this particular uh, person was doing was around saying, well, we can't, it's not just about creating equity and access, it's also about decolonizing outdoor spaces. And I, I'm hearing you talk about this idea that we are members and that that is a very decolonizing mindset, right? Because it's about power with, like shared power. Like I'm no better or more powerful than the prairie dog. And I have to get into that humble space if I'm really going to be a member of this ecosystem. Yeah, it just um, kind of blew my mind. <laughs> that's cool. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I think, you know, I'm a writer. And so I, I, I kind of see the world a lot of times differently. I was talking with my agent, the legendary Marie Brown. She's Harlem based and been in the business for a long time. And, thankful to work with her, but we're talking about the American story. And the American story is particularly the story of people on the land. And, and I see and feel that those stories are embedded like layers of sandstone. So what we do with, oh, now with our lives is history is not over with. We, what you do with your life, what we all do lives, those are new stories. And our work is a challenge to create uh, new stories and see our lives as part of the, the American story of not just our history is over with, but it's ever present and we're uh, um, uh, building building that too. And there's so many, a lot, you know, it's also about, we talk about when we say about being participants and listening, we, so many stories that uh, every square foot of the prairie is going to, to tell you a new story as you walk in. There's so much life, even in that, uh, uh, that, that as you walk through that, it may be sun, wind, grass, and blue sky and a universal experience of your spirit, but all these other animals and birds, they have their eyes. They look, they look through the world, they look at you, they look at each other, they have their languages. Prairie dogs have been here for a million years. They speak one of the most complex, complex languages ever to start. But what did we do? We poison gas, sh shot them, blew them, killed billions of them because we didn't see that. I heard somebody say, they're talking about the Indonesian rainforest. You know, they just wiped out another 150,000 acres for palm oil. Uh, the forest only had value after it was cut down. You know, and this is like, somebody called our prairie park when the, the state was trying to sell it. They said two pieces of dirt. And we, and we had, you know, this was the most pristine, beautiful place I had ever worked for. And we, and our youth and our young adults, we had been in that and had been part of part of that that uh, that fabric of life. So it's kind of uh, this otherness or treating the earth um, as something that's just there. Try it sometime. Go ahead and try try to lowercase Mars or Pluto, but try to lowercase Earth and uh, it, Google autocorrect won't won't, bot, won't mind with you. You'll notice that we have such a dismissive mindset of 
Earth, which is the only livable place that we know about that has, has life in it, but it doesn't matter. We don't give a crap most of the time. You know, so it's okay then we shut it shut off, just like we shut ourselves off from um, other people sometimes that uh, what those life perspectives and values are. So I try to bring this back, yeah. back together because we ain't got no more time left. Yeah, it strikes me, and I'm going to go to the chat here in a second. It strikes me when you're talking too that that means that inherent in this work are going to be experiences with uh, our own anger and disappointment as well as grief and loss. And, mm -hmm. and I think that what, what hits me about that is that the only way to be able to process that and still actively commit to co-creating hope is doing it in community, is doing it together. Um, and I, I, I wrote that down. I was thinking about just how do we, through this work, create a context of hope? And, I, and it really was this idea that hope is a co-created process um, because we are up against some pretty big systems in this work. Uh, private prisons, you know, uh, the school to prison pipeline, systemic racism, those are huge things. So I think um, hope has to be co-created and it's rolling up our sleeves. Um, a couple people, Jareed, in the chat were writing some comments, and then I would just invite you all. We are done in seven minutes, so if you have, is that right, Matthew? Thumbs up? Okay, so if you have any specific questions, you can put those in the chat um, as well. Just some comments about people really resonating with healing people, land, and non-human animals. Um, people liking the idea of refuge and restoration. Um, really liking the ecological health model and the reciprocal uh, restoration model. People also resonating about the fact that trauma is very real and that traditional therapy doesn't always do that much, but when they're out gardening and uh, in the dirt, that's really something that makes a big difference. Um, a need for more of that. Let's see if there are any more questions. And for those of you that are following the chat, I actually put the link to uh, Jareed's book, first book, right? Um, uh, Ghetto Plainsman in the chat feature. Yeah, they may, um, you know, it's just, again, it's just, uh, they're making a movie out of that, but for me, it's a way, it's, it's how I came to navigate the, those pitfalls and, and American violence, and including that which we often accept into ourselves. You mentioned depression and anxiety, and, and sometimes there are other folks who, who are dealing with other things, but this, the, this, this uh, work, when you have it partnered uh, with the, the right um, social work support, I think that over time can build the, you know, enough training to get past, to, to, to learn to shut off those negative thinkings because you've been training yourself over time. Right. That doesn't happen right away. You know, but it's something that, you know, and sometimes for any of those, the work is, is uh, available to adopt and uh, adapt by others. And we are here to help those uh, because that's how it gets to the point. But, you know, it's a matter of, uh, sometimes you may just be a bus stop on, or a, a town on the, on the road of a person's own metaphorical journey sure. across the country. So, you don't have to be the end all, and you may not save everybody. Uh, but what you do in helping out is is your memorable stop on their yeah. life, and you help Jerry, them. Sorry, someone. I just wanted to interrupt you real quickly because you're talking about this idea of giving support for people that might be interested in replicating. Sienna asked, "Are there small models of this taking place that can be copied?" or re-implemented in other locations. And then someone else said they'd love to replicate this here in Florida. So would this be an opportunity for folks just to reach out to you uh, for partnership ideas or you wanna speak to that? Yes, and uh, we like we did the plenary at Texas Southern where it, the whole way of adopting it was put online. Uh, but yes, they can reach us at Great Plains Restoration Council. There is a, a workbook and we do help others adopt and adapt it as a model, as a working model. And it can be, it's a, it's a 
Queensland, Australia, Griffith University, they reached out to you and I, we helped them take it on for, for their domestic violence programs. So, you know, it can be adopted and adapted to uh, any ecosystem. And I'll put the link, I put it in earlier, but just in case anyone missed it, there's the link to um, Great Plains Restoration Council's website and you can find Jerry there. So one other person said, um, for someone who's just starting out and who are new to this, um, what's one piece of advice? Maybe this will be our last question to end with. What's one piece of advice to people who are new to this, if you can narrow it down that much? What would you say, Jareed? One piece of advice is uh, uh, work on your, you know, I would say is, is uh, look at, you know, in a practical manner, look at earned income ways so you can develop funds in a, a way that you're not strictly reliant on charitable giving. So you come at more of it from a position of strength, if you can, as a business model. And also work, make sure that you spend time with yourself because when you know, we, in the space, you are dealing with lots of trauma. And so some of the psychological health work is, is good for ourselves as, as practitioners. And perseverance is you know, your spirit's going to be tested, but you're still, it, the work vitalizes you as well. So. Okay. A lot of times you may find yourself, I would recommend you um, give yourself some ecological health uh, practice. <laughs> and too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And um, thanks, Cherie. Thanks, Matthew and Anna and those of you that have helped organize and for everyone hanging in and listening, sharing some screen time with us today. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you all for um, joining uh, with us. Uh, and we'll be... Uh, We'll see you out there I'm in the ocean on the prairie somewhere. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Christine and Jareed, um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, so at this point, um, we're going to take our 15 minute break. Um, we will leave the Zoom open um, so you can stay connected as you go take a break. I encourage you to uh, stretch your legs, move around a little bit. Um, and um, we will see you back here, I guess it's 3.30 um, Eastern time, but exactly around 15 minutes from now. Um, so thanks again to our two presenters now, um, and um, we'll see you all uh, in 15 minutes. This final session of our first day of the conference on social and ecological infrastructure for recidivism reduction. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have been with us the whole day. Thank you for um, uh, engaging and staying with us. Um, and <clears throat> a reminder that um, we will begin tomorrow at um, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can find uh, in the chat the full um, schedule um, with presenter buyers. We are a reminder also that we are not reading the full presenter bios and encourage you to go to the website hickson.yale.edu to find the full speaker bios. Uh, and also um, to um, uh, please uh, feel free to use the chat as where the chat feature is open. Um, folks have been engaging it quite a lot, which is great to see. And so please do um, throughout the presentation post um, your comments and reactions um, uh, as we're going along. Um, but uh, I think without further uh, other introduction. I'd like to now introduce our next our next speakers and topic on which workshop on implementing empowering environmental education in prison and jail settings. And so, with us for this hour, uh, we have Raquel Pinderhues, who is founder and executive director of Roots of Success and professor of urban studies and planning at San Francisco State University, and Grady Mitchell, who is a certified Roots of Success instructor and uh, master trainer. Um, and I will. Um, also add as well that um, uh, Raquel has been a wonderful um, kind of support and, and occasional informal advisor throughout kind of thinking about this conference as well. And so um, much appreciation um, for her, but really wonderful to welcome both of you here for this hour long Thank session. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see, oh, I should have to get this to, just give me one second here, let me get this on slideshow and start from the first slide.
So can you all see those slides? Yes. Yes, looks good. Okay. So I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm making this presentation on Ohlone Miwok lands. And I want to thank the elders and ancestors for knowing and caring for this land. These are some of the elders you can see here. My slides are not advancing, but let me see if I could get them to advance. Uh, Grady Mitchell and I are here representing a program called the Roots of Success Environmental Literacy and Job Training Program. We are very happy to be with you. And we want to use our experience with this program to have a conversation about how to offer empowering programs. And I put the definition of how we define empower on the slide, which is basically making people feel stronger and more confident, especially in controlling their lives and claiming their rights and giving them some sense of authority and agency. And I think this is an extremely meaningful conversation because as I said in here on the slide, prisons and jails are inherently oppressive places, highly controlled, places where people have very little control over their life and their rights. And so the question of how we can offer empowering programs in these settings is a very important pro uh, question. And we're going to give you some information based on our experience, and then we're hoping that we can open for questions. And we want to encourage people to unmute and ask questions rather than going to the chat. We don't have anybody here who can check the chat with us, so we're hoping to have a dialogue. Um, I founded the Roots of Success program in 2010 with the goal of preparing youth and adults who come from the communities that are most impacted by environmental problems and injustices with the knowledges and skills they need to access environmental jobs and careers and improve environmental and social conditions in their communities. And this is a very important uh, work that we're all doing together because these jobs are primarily taken up by college educated graduates and the people who bear the most burden for the environmental problems that we all experience and the injustices that are experienced disproportionately by specific communities don't have very many accesses to these jobs. Uh, what you see here is a program called Green Streets in San Francisco. It's a program started by a group of reentry uh, folks, men and women who had served time in California jails and prisons, who started a recycling program in their housing, uh, public housing units, a very successful program. Just wanted to have it there as an inspiration for the kind of jobs that we can have people do. Roots of Success is described by us as an empowering program. Uh, and as I said, it specifically meets the needs of youth and adults that have been failed by the education system. And because so many of the people we work with have been failed by multiple systems, we address these needs, um, their needs for labor market preparation and uh, activism uh, in the following ways. Our course strengthens individuals' academic and professional skills. This is very important because as we know, incarcerated populations uh, by and large have very high levels of lower levels of, act of adult literacy. So it's very important to bring up people's academic skills as we prepare them to work in the environmental jobs and improve conditions in their communities. It helps people uh, deeply understand the root causes of, and impacts of environmental challenges and injustices. It's filled with exercises where people get to discuss how to address environmental challenges and, ex and injustices. Grady's gonna talk more about that later. It includes a module on community organizing and leadership. It also includes a module on financial literacy and social entrepreneurship. Uh, it prepares individuals for 125 jobs and careers in infrastructure and environmental sectors. And it inspires people to pursue um, activism in their communities that will improve environmental and social conditions. Roots of Success is a national program. It's offered in prisons and jails and juvenile facilities throughout the United States. It's also used in job training and reentry programs, youth programs, alternative high schools, many of the settings where folks who come from just uh, frontline communities uh, are located. Um, since 2010, over 25,000 students have graduated from the course, and more than 50% of those students have taken the course while incarcerated. Um, the program centers around 10 modules that basically correspond to the 22 sectors in where environmental and um, infrastructure jobs are located. We start with a module on the fundamentals of environmental literacy, where we introduce people to the basic science and social science policy and planning 
ideas, approaches, and um, issues that help them understand environmental issues. We then have a module on water, water management, a module on waste, a module on transportation, a module on energy, a module on building, a module on health, food, and agriculture, and as I said, a module on community organizing and leadership, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship, and application and practice. In each one of these modules, students basically learn about what I sort of call the it. What is water? How is it molecularly structured? Uh, where is it located? What is the difference between fresh water and salt water? Where is water stored? Why is water inequitably distributed around the planet? Why is it that some people have uh, more access to higher quality water than others? Why is it that some people pay more for water than others? Why is it that some people uh, live in places where water is more abundant? And once, why is what, you know, what is the molecular structure of water and how is the molecular structure of water uh, connected to how pollution moves through bodies of water and how pollution affects us in our own bodies, which are composed of so much water. Um, after students understand what we mean or the basic characteristics of water, of waste, of transportation, of energy, of food, of agriculture, they basically get introduced to the problems that are associated with how we have managed these sectors. In the case of water, for example, we would talk about the fact that we've managed water inefficiently, that we haven't conserved it, that we've polluted it, that it is inequitably distributed, um, that some people, as I said, have access to higher quality water than others. So students deeply learn to think about the problems associated with fresh with water. And of course, they learn about the fact that there's very little fresh water on the planet. Fresh water is what we need as human beings to survive. And then in understanding the problems in the next section of the modules, they learn about the approaches that we can use to address these problems and these injustices. How can we use water more efficiently? How can we conserve it? If we've polluted it, how can we clean it? If it's inequitably distributed, how can we address those inequities? Uh, if, we, uh, if people are unfairly being charged large amounts of water, uh, how can we reduce those, those charges through, from a policy perspective as well as from a um, infrastructure perspective? And after students learn about the problems in the sector, after they learn about the approaches we can use to address the solutions in the sector, they then learn about the jobs that come into place as you try to address these problems. So if we're trying to conserve water, there are a whole series of jobs that are associated with, you know, installing drip irrigations instead of surface level irrigations or gray water systems or rainwater catchment systems or water education campaigns or appropriate technologies uh, low flush toilets. Um, and there are many both manual labor jobs and non-manual labor jobs that are associated with how we manage the water sector or the waste sector or the transportation sector. And we prepare people for the jobs in those sectors. And we have a very robust component of the curriculum that prepares people who have barriers to employment uh, for uh, interviews with employers in green job sectors. Uh, they leave the program with a resume, with a cover letter, having gone through mock interviews, having thought about the kinds of jobs they would want to do and what qualifications they would need to do them, understanding the certificate and training that is available to them. So it's a soup to nuts curriculum. And then after that, we give people the opportunity to think about how they would apply what they have learned in the class in various situations. They might go before uh, work in teams to go before the board of supervisors to talk, for example, in the waste module about whether or not they want to landfill in their community, understanding that it might bring jobs, but it also might bring um, hazards and problems, and sort of figuring that through and, and in teams kind of working out these problems and then coming back and sharing their thoughts as they, as they go through these activities, which allow them to put what they've learned into place. And then, as I said, modules on uh, community organizing and financial literacy which give people additional skills. Um, this is a, 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 a picture of a group of Roots of Success instructors trained and certified as is Grady Mitchell, and Grady's gonna talk about this, who are at the Coffee Creek Women's Correctional Center in Oregon. And um, we wanna point out very importantly that one of the most empowering components of our model 
of our program is that Roots of Success is taught by incarcerated men and women to their peers. And most of these teachers are doing this work as their paid full-time work in the prison. This is one of the only academic certificate bearing programs in the country where incarcerated men and women are paid full-time to teach the course, to direct the program. I wanted to mention because they talked about this in Insight Garden and I was just want to say both of these presentations before ours were just very, very yes. touching in the most beautiful sense of the word and inspiring. And thank you so much for the amazingly good work that you're all doing. But during COVID-19, Roots of Success was and is during lockdown one of the only and very often the only education and job training programs being offered in prisons throughout the United States, precisely because the program is taught by incarcerated people. And as a consequence, they are able to offer the program in their housing units. And we received a big grant, a CARES grant from uh, the state of Oregon to train up and offer thousands of people in the Oregon prison system, uh, the Roots of Success course while uh, they are on lockdown where they have a lot of idle time and of course fear and anxiety is high. These are just some statistics that have been done by external reviewers about the impact of Roots of Success. I only put them in because of the last presentation. It is important for us to know what outside evaluators find when they look at our program. After taking the Roots of Success class, 98% of our students have a better understanding of environmental problems and solutions. They understand the root causes of these problems and injustices. They feel inspired and empowered to work in their communities. They feel a shift in their perspective, an increase in self-awareness, a heightened consideration of their relationships with others. They feel a responsibility to make the world better. They plan to share and they do share, as Grady will talk about, what they learn in the course with others. They understand how green jobs fit into building a more just and sustainable world. They're excited about working in environmental and social justice fields. They're interested in community, community engagement. They feel more comfortable taking tests, which is important because they have to go on often to take certificate programs. Their academic skills have been strengthened. They, um, they feel more motivated in educational settings. And this is not unimportant because so many of our folks have made been made to feel that they don't have a place in educational settings. Um, in terms of professional development, 98% of graduates feel more prepared for job interviews. They feel more knowledgeable about green careers. They're more motivated to pursue employment opportunities they did not previously know or think were accessible to them. Grady will also talk about this, how we open up people's sense of the possibilities in their lives, as do the programs before us and they increase their professional vocabulary, which is not unimportant uh, in interviews with employers. Additionally, they feel more prepared for employment. They feel more comfortable working in teams. In terms of the review, the external uh, reviews that have been, uh, evaluations that have been done three, six, and 12 months after people graduate from the program. This is for folks who are re-entering. Many of our folks will stay incarcerated for longer periods of time. People are finding jobs within three months. Um, they are employed six months later. They feel comfortable speaking in public on behalf of the work that they're doing. And 86% are making better wages than they have ever earned and uh, finding opportunities for occupational mobility. And then in terms of the staff, Grady and I wanna talk about the staff. We wanna talk about how DOC sees this program. We wanna talk about how staff understand and see this program. We wanna talk about how this program changes relationships between incarcerated populations and guards and other members of, of the staff. Um, external evaluations, again, from the prisons themselves. 100% of program directors observe positive behavioral changes in participants. 95 or 99% uh, say that Roots of Success improves students' academic skills. That comes from evaluations from the teachers. 98% thought participants were better prepared for job interviews, that Roots of Success had helped people reach their goals, that Roots of Success increased people's ability to learn and understand environmental problems and solutions, and of course, that they would recommend the program to, to others. I, I could go on, but I think I'm just gonna stop here. It's just one other thing. 
I want to say before I turn it over to Grady. Um, actually, I do, I'll do that now. This is a photograph of somebody that Grady and I both care very deeply about. This is Cyril Waldron, one of our, oops, one of our Roots of Success incarcerated teachers. And um, Cyril is also incarcerated in Washington, uh, was trained with Grady. And here you see Cyril uh, teaching in the classroom. So I just wanna, oh, I'm not sure why this is moving so much, but I'm trying to give you a slide for Grady to talk with that shows you what a Roots of Success classroom looks like. So I hope you can stay here. So Grady, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully I'm unmuted. I'm sort of getting adjusted to technology here. My name is Grady Mitchell. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to all the presenters and the workshops today, uh, to the hosts. Uh, it's been very informative uh, and very delightful, and I'm truly honored and humbled to be allowed to participate today. Uh, I'm 61 years of age. I was incarcerated at the age of 24. And after, thir after serving excuse me, after serving 37 years of a life without parole sentence, I was released January 28th, 2021. I've been a Roots of Success facilitator and trainer for eight years. Six of those years I was a trainer, excuse me. Uh, I've taught hundreds of men. The way that we define empowerment in the program is one, the course is taught by incarcerated instructors to our peers. It's important because that removes uh, the mentality of us versus them. Uh, we can communicate with them, we understand them. And also we have that opportunity uh, of seeing them on the breezeway, seeing them in the yard, talking to them uh, and giving them some demonstrations on what they're actually learning in the classroom. The second thing is instructors go through uh, a two to three day in-depth training to prepare to teach is not almost like you just don't get a book and say, here, go and deliver uh, the curriculum. Absolutely not. Uh, we actually have to go through a very rigorous training process and is, man, it's, it's really impactful. It's helpful. Uh, it's beyond helpful. I just don't have the right adjective to describe it. The third thing is, uh, is the instructors are not just trained by, or not just knowledgeable uh, to the material, they're experienced. Uh, they're very, very we experienced roots of success instructors. Uh, the fourth thing about in relation to empowerment is that instructors are paid. And this is their full-time job in prison. And I do believe, as Raquel had mentioned, that this is uh, one of the only uh, academic pay programs. I know in this state it is, that I, and I've ever heard of in my 37 years of incarceration. Uh, there are no requirements to take the course. Anyone can join. As I stated, uh, I was serving life without parole and consistently I ran into that wall of I was denied acceptance because of the length of my sentence. Uh, I wasn't a priority. I mean, I hear that so much. And, and with Roots of Success, it doesn't matter if you have six months or 90 days or 60 years. It doesn't matter if you STG affiliated, which is security threat group. Uh, it don't matter if you have college education or you're illiterate. And I would hopefully get the opportunity to share uh, some anecdotal uh, examples later on. Uh, and it's open, not very often do we have uh, a student the schedule with little time to leave, but the flexibility of Roots of Success allows us to then work one-on-one -on -one with that student, uh, where the regular normal class may meet for three hours in one day, then we'll take him and we may meet for six or seven hours in order to get him through the training so he would be, he would have his certification and become a part of the Roots of Success community of practice. Uh, so it, that's very important as well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's inclusive, uh, which is just the whole thing about root success, which I love. Um, and the sixth thing is it allows student, students to, we allow them to uh, participate in what we call rules of engagement. And collectively as a group, uh, we've been trained to insist 
on professionalism. And we leave the moors of prison outside of the classroom. When students walk into the classroom, whatever's going on on that side of the door is left. And we, we require, uh, we insist, and because they participated in the rules of engagement, they abide by them. I mean, a couple of times they had to remind me, you know, of a couple of things. So it's, it's really great to see that. And I think that's a part of the, actually, I know that's a part of that inclusiveness that we feel, especially from the incarcerated side. Uh, and we hold each other accountable, the instructors and the students. We hold each other accountable to the rules by, and that's once again, that collective development. Uh, and everyone abides by them and they honor them. Uh, some of the staff members that sit outside, we don't have any staff members in our classroom. There are no officers, no guards, no nothing. And I, like I said, I've been doing this for eight years and there's not one incident, not one, where there has been disrespect to staff, disrespect to other students, disrespect to facilitators or instructors or guests who come and observe our program. Uh, not one incident has occurred in Roots of Success classes. And so the staff see that. They see the, uh, the impact that the, the program has uh, on us as individuals. And once again, it, it starts at we require that professionalism. Because let's face it, a lot of, a lot of times <clears throat> in prison, we don't have that. We don't have someone that hold us accountable to the things. And usually we just told what to do instead of being a part of that process. And that's what Roots does. We raise the bar and then continually find that the men, they just, they just reach up and grab it. I mean, it's just phenomenal uh, to see transformations. I get emotional thinking about uh, some of our most challenged students, how they came in and how they leave. Some of our most educated men, college educated men, how they came in and how they left with a different appreciation. Some of our men that were illiterate, didn't know how to read and write. Uh, and what they're doing in the communities now is, is impressive. Um, excuse me. Anyway, so, and students and number, and the eighth thing is students get the message from day one that the instructors and the Roots of Success uh, program staff are there for them 100%. Uh, that's the very first day, as well as the Roots of Success program director, which is Dr. Penda Hughes. She'll write letters of support to uh, resentencing and clemency boards, and that's for any Roots of Success student. Now, a lot of time we get those cookie cutter uh, letters and we get those, okay, just you know, type in the name and it'll, you know, it'll just put it off. Absolutely not. Uh, that's not what goes on in Roots of Success. Each letter is personalized. Uh, we encourage your students to contact Dr. Penny Hughes, write her personally. I've yet to know any students, not one, and I'm not by any means exacerbating this. I've yet to know any student that has asked for assistance from her and from Roots of Success and did not get it. Uh, and all the letters are personal, specific to that individual. And that's phenomenal in prison. Because normally when you take programs, uh, when we take things, you know, you, you go through the program, you get your certificate or you complete the program and that's it. Okay, see you later. You know, deuces, you know, we're, we're gone. Uh, not lose of success. I mean, it's still there. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in my... Uh, return to the community in January 28. I've been contacted by several uh, people that are part of the community of practice. Uh, also, when we talk about empowerment, the course this the course is structured to allow students to build on what they know, what they know, and their life experience. And it don't matter if you were raised on a farm or you were in an urban or you're in the suburbs. It don't matter where you're from. Uh, we are able to take that and make it a part of the course. Uh, and that's great. I believe uh, popular education is what we use most. <laughs> uh, the young man that you saw earlier on the screen, Sir Walton, a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, man, it's just, I miss him. <laughs> I really miss him a lot. 
Uh, he's very dedicated, very, very dedicated and taught me so much. And that's the kind of uh, bond that, that's created as a part of this Roots of Success course. Uh, the class is structured, is structured in a way that ensures that students are working together. Uh, they share experiences and they learn from each other all the time. Uh, it's about respect for others. It's about popular education, as I stated. And it's also about conflict resolution. These are the results of what happens uh, throughout the course. Um, the class, the Roots of Success class content is directly relevant to the lives of incarcerated people, uh, their families and the communities. Uh, it connects education to employment opportunities. Uh, we go through, uh, a lot of students uh, walk through the door the first day and we encourage them to participate and ask questions. Uh, and they say, well, I'm not a great speaker. Or, you know, I'm, I'm a little antisocial. I don't want to talk. And by the end of the course, you can't get them quiet. You know, which is a great thing. Uh, it's, it's just phenomenal how many people we've seen. When we get to the mock interviews, a lot of guys think, okay, well, I know him, or I know Grady, or I know Dave, or I know those guys, so I can just go and do it. So we have them step outside of the room, and we set, you know, the room is set up. As soon as they walk back through the door, they it's like they feel it. They feel the seriousness of it. They feel... Uh, as if they were actually walking in for an interview. And that's what we want. That's the way we were trained uh, to become instructors. Uh, that's the way that we apply the methodology is when they sit down in front of their chair in front of us, then now the questions are going to be asked and they're not soft questions and we don't laugh and giggle. It's very serious. Uh, because when they go out to the community, when they go, when they come back home, uh, when they go for a job, it's going to be serious. They understand the gravity of the situation. And then, but what's the best part about it is, is they understand then how to better answer those questions. And it's not just one mock interview. No, no, no. It's, it's a couple of them placed throughout the course. So, and, and so it's not, you know, it's not like you're one and done. They know that they also are going to have another one coming as well. So it, it, it definitely builds and, and you, then we can see what you do better and build on that. Uh, in some, uh, the Roots of Success training includes a, a methodology that empowers in general and on a case-by-case -case analysis. So when people are trained as instructors, from day one, that environment of respect, professionalism, and inclusiveness is emphasized. Um, I, I would definitely have to talk about uh, the Washington State Department of Corrections. Uh, a phenomenal response to Roots of Success. I'm amazed at how supportive they've been. Um, the Evergreen State College, I think it's through the SPP, but it's, you know, the Roots of Success curriculum, I mean, excuse me, the course is, is just that, it's just that great. I was trying to think of a really good, nice word to say, but it's just great. You know what I mean? I, I think that's just the way that it's on my heart. That's the way that I deliver it. Um, the emotions and the passions that you see, uh, this is what the course does. Uh, and not just me. I mean, sometimes we'll get those guys that say, okay, I believe in it. You have that one or two or three or four guys. No, I'm talking hundreds of guys. There's so much what I share. So, and some people are probably thinking, you know, as a lot of these programs may have this. So what really makes Roots of Success different? Uh, like I said, taught by, tier, taught by peers, the, the popular education, the inclusiveness uh, from the start of the class, and just raising that bar, there was an instructor at a community college that walked to our classroom one day. And we, were, we have meetings. We meet collectively as instructors so we can always grow and see what we can do better. We talk about the students' progress. We look at their books, uh, their workbooks, and, we, and then we'll know who may need help in what areas. It's designed that way. And so, and he came into the door and he said, hey, can I, 
uh, interrupt you guys for a minute. I, absolutely, come on in. I mean, we, we invited instructors too. Uh, excuse me, professors too, you can come on in. He said, man, well, every time I walk by you guys' classroom, I see everyone so happy. I see everyone engaged. I see everyone excited. He said, man, what are you guys over here doing? You know what I mean? He said, the guys in my class are sleeping. You know what I mean? They got their heads on the desk. They're not energetic, they're not enthused. Uh, and it was rather simple. We raised the bar. We demand professionalism. There's no profanity, no slang. Uh, we don't, it's, it's just not accepted. And that's the way we're trained. Don't think that this is something that we're just doing on our own. No, that's how we're trained to uh, provide the course. The staff members, I would like to go back to that simply because we always have some, uh, some naysayers about it. Uh, one very quick story is uh, I definitely remember a staff member that was you know, he was, oh, you shouldn't be leaving those guys in there by themselves. Anything can be going on in that room. He was just one of those old, old school officers. And pretty soon he was looking in the door and seeing what we were talking about. And, and he was coming in and I started seeing him. So we invited him in one day and to sit in the class. And he left and began to apply some of the things we were actually teaching to his own home. And now he's a very, very stark supporter of his success because he, he actually he said, man, you know, I really thought you guys were in here talking about other stuff. He said, but well, this stuff works. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, what I mean, I was like, no surprise to us. So that's another impact. Uh, one other one, I know I said real quick, um, there was a female officer who also uh, was very, very against uh, inmates teaching other inmates uh, being alone in the classroom. And unbeknownst to any of us facilitators, they have in this day what they call uh, behavior observations. And so they can go into the computer and type things about you or type something they may observe about your behavior. And we may never see them. I mean, we're supposed to, but sometimes we don't. And I didn't know it <clears throat> until I was talking to my counselor one day that she had actually went in and submitted a behavior observation on us. We facilitate as collective or individuals, but, and she had actually said how impressed she was at the behavior uh, of the students in the class. The, the uh, I think she said the courteousness and politeness of the instructors and the abilities to not only abide by the rules, but to be sure that students abide by them as well. That was great to me. Uh, and I didn't know it. I, I think that was the best part. It's not like she was, you know, trying, I was trying to get brownie points or nothing. So I say these things and I share these things uh, because it's what Ruth's success is. That's how we're trained. Uh, men walk away feeling included. And knowing one of the greatest things is that we, we talk about the jobs. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're in prison, you could think, man, I'm not ever going to be a wastewater management treatment uh, operator. Or, I'm not ever going to be able to go out into the community and organize anything. I'm not ever, you know, they think the criteria you have to have either some kind of college degree or this. And then when they understand and see the criteria and the qualifications for these jobs and how much the salary is and how much money they can make at it, they'd be like, whoa. I mean, they'd be like, man, you, you mean all I needed was a, a high school education for this? And these, man, I already do some of this stuff. I said, absolutely. And so then they're encouraged. It, 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 that's the definition of empowerment. The definition of empowerment is when the student come in <clears throat> and he can't read or write. And he's a really good friend of mine now. And he can't read or write. He's illiterate totally illiterate. And now he's in the community. He has a community, a nonprofit community organization that goes out and builds tiny homes for the homeless. He support food banks and he go around to the food banks and assist them in distributing food for them. And right now he's in apprenticeship training on his own uh, to become, to work for one of the trade unions. And so it's just great. And he would tell you himself, I've 
I really, he, he testified in my clemency hearing uh, just how phenomenal Roots of Success was for him and as far as uh, the beginning of our friendship. So I, 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 perhaps I've, you know, I don't want to talk too much um, about me. Uh, this is about the empowerment uh, uh, and the way that Roots of Success is capable of providing that. So if you have questions, please chime in. Don't just, you know, we, we encourage it. Grady, I think you and I will just, we'll be very sort of spontaneous here and respond to the audience, but I just want to summarize a couple of things that Grady, well, I guess what I want to say about what Grady is sharing with us is that what we're trying to do in this workshop is talk about the parts of our program that can be replicated in other programs in prisons and jails. Absolutely. And how empowering that can be for individuals. Because as Grady said, there's a lot of programming that goes on in prisons, but it is not always empowering. And it can, it can be uh, with just some changes. And that can make a huge difference in the way people feel about their lives every single day behind bars. So-, so I, They say we can raise our hands, so I'm gonna raise my hand. No. Uh, well, no. It was, it was, it was, when you were saying that, there was two things that I really wanted to say that I missed out on because we, we, we talk about this gang culture. Uh, it's very, very difficult to have two op opposing gang members in the same classroom. Guess what? Roots of Success has successfully done it. Not once, not twice. I've taught over 25 classes, and I can assure you over 50% of those classes had opposing gang members sitting in the classroom, learning and understanding and appreciating each other. We could talk about the differences in age groups. Sometimes we have guys like myself that's over 60. You have those 24 year olds. There was a war veteran, couldn't hardly hear. The young gang members embraced him and said, wait a minute, slow down a minute, man, because our friend Bill, he, he didn't hear what you just said. Slow it down a little bit. They embraced him and be sure that we did not move forward without him. So we don't leave anyone behind. The other, the, the, the other thing that I want to mention is, is the, the empower, on the empowerment aspect and how it can apply to the prison itself. We had students, they were, cause you know, we work in groups sometimes we'll mix them up or whatever. And these students, what they did on their own is they wanted to demonstrate uh, how much water was being wasted by the facility. So what they did is they went in several different units, not the same units, several different units. And they began, when people got up in the morning to brush their teeth, they had an eight ounce cup of water and they would measure the water as guys left the water running while they were brushing their teeth and they would, they would gauge how much water was being wasted. And then they, they collected all this information and data. I think it came up to like 1.8 gallons uh, per person and it was like 1,700 inmates in the facility. And they came out with something like 3,000 plus gallons of water each time, you know, that, that you get up in the morning and brush your teeth that was being wasted just by leaving the faucet on. So what the administration did was they began to send out little posters, little information points saying, hey, turn off the water, you know, when you brush your teeth, save the water, we'll have more water for showers, we'll do this. And, and I was, uh, and Mr. Chris Eitzel, who's the plant manager at that facility, he had all that data and he actually saw a decrease in water usage, which was just totally awesome. It was, it was phenomenal. And Grady, I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the questions that we have in the list of questions we want to address is how do you incentivize prisons to offer empowering programs? We've collected statistics from all over the country that show that after integrating our program into a facility, facilities save millions of dollars, millions of dollars in water waste and energy bills because Grady will testify and so do all of other our teachers that our students are on fire to make changes both in their own lives and to make changes within the facility itself. They start where they are and they walk their talk wherever they go. I want to tell a story about Grady uh, with his permission. I know he doesn't mind because one of the unintended consequences of the model that we created is that 
our courses are taught by instruct incarcerated men and women who are serving long sentences. Grady had a life sentence until his clemency. And the reason that facilities uh, require us to train and work with folks serving long sentences is they don't want to invest in people who are going to leave the prison in a short time. So we're working with folks who are serving long sentences and often life sentences. And we did not realize because um, we just weren't thinking about it at the time, what a phenomenal impact this has on the lives of people that have to stay behind bars for long periods of time. Grady will speak to this in a minute, but it changes their lives. It gives them a completely new purpose and it makes their experience in prison. Um, I can't call it better because I don't think we can use that word about people who have to serve time, but different, different and gives them a meaning and a purpose which is not there before. Um, in Grady's case, I just wanted to share, this is somebody who at the time thought he had a life sentence and was communicating very, very regularly with his incredibly wonderful wife and family and sharing the information that he was learning in our class with his family. One of the things that he was able to do was in our water and energy and building modules, was share with his family some of the ways that they could reduce their household energy bills. And he got his, his wife, who was not interested in any of this stuff at the time, she was not thinking about any of these environmental <laughs> issues. He got her to call the utility company. He got a, a new refrigerator that was um, energy yes. efficient. He had, well, he can tell you the story, but he got the windows corked and, and many other things. And he was able to reduce his family's household energy bills by $400 a month in the winter and in the summer yes. months of heating and cooling. And I remember the day, Grady, where you talked to me about that, crying and saying, this is the contribution that I was able to make to my family while I'm behind bars. This is the change. These are the economic benefits that I was able to bring to them. That is not a lone story. That's happening over and over and over again. And I want to say, yes. not just in our program, you know, we heard from Insight Garden, we heard from the other program. We are all transformative, empowering programs. And it's beautiful to share the day with programs that are empowering. But I think the point we wanted to make in, in bringing these issues into the conference is that we are not typical, we are atypical. Yes. All of the programs that are being run with incarcerated populations, reentry populations, should be more like ours. So we're trying to share with you some of the features. And I had a slide, but basically to summarize, we have incarcerated people who are teaching our course who are paid full time to do the work. That allows them not only to do the work in the classroom, but they are doing the work all the time. Our teachers are helping every student that they have who's you know, formulating a release plan to integrate it into their release plan, everything that they've learned in the course and how they can apply for green jobs. On our side, we're ready to, as, as in Inside Garden, we're ready to receive them, embrace them, support them, uh, provide them with recommendations, provide them with connections. Um, our teachers are trained. They use teaching guides and teaching, uh, you know, teaching materials because when they start the class, they don't know the content. Grady didn't know anything about environmental issues when he started teaching. He didn't know how to teach math. He didn't know how to teach reading. He didn't know how to teach writing. He didn't know how to teach community organizing, financial literacy. He didn't understand issues related to water waste. And he's now one of the premier experts in the United States on these issues, as is Hart, his fellow incarcerated instructors. Um, so we have teaching materials. These teaching materials are filled with worksheets where the students are engaging the activities that are formally integrated into the course. Everybody in the whole country who opens up to page 13 in the water module or 17 in the waste module is essentially providing students with the deep education that the teaching materials and the training allows them to facilitate. Um, so there's a guaranteed outcome that the things that we're trying to do are actually gonna happen at the end. Um, importantly, Grady talked about relationship with staff. It's really important that we are able to show very early on that we can hold the responsibility of being on our own in a facility, of, um, of many other things that we do in the class. Our violence reduction statistics are phenomenal. 70% reduction in inmate to inmate violence. I don't use that word, that's a technical term in the facility. 
and the 40% staff inmate violence reductions. This comes directly from the prisons we work with. And then I told you, millions of dollars saved on the energy side. Um, and then also, Grady is a master trainer, which means that we train our teachers to train other teachers, which means that the facilities, the prisons themselves do not have to pay for new teachers to be nurtured, trained, and available in an ongoing basis. Grady has left his prison. We are so happy to be able to say that and is reunited with his beautiful family uh, and doing amazing work. But he has left behind many, many other people that he has trained to teach who are continuing the program in the facility in which he served. I'm probably leaving a lot of other things out, but I think Grady, maybe we'll open up for questions. Yes. We'd like people to just ask your question or provide us with your thoughts, your ideas. And then if we can be efficient, we can get to a lot of folks and have a conversation about um, how do we do this work? And we're hoping that you actually ask us how to do it or share with us you know, briefly how you're doing it. I have a question. You all talked a little bit about this, but how do you build the culture? Like, how do you build those agreements? Like, what does that look like? Do you do you cycle back to those every class? Talk to me about the process. Well, the, the the process is is really to me simple, I guess, because we were trained so well. Is that when when students first come in, uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation and we go through it, explain what the course is about, what they can be expecting. And so we'll get to that section and then say, okay, well, let's develop the rules of engagement. Okay. And we'll have some things already on those rules of engagement. And then we'll say, what else needs to be on here? And people will start participating and sharing. This is on the first day, mind you. This is on the first day because of that inclusiveness, because they feel included. And once they uh, share in the process of developing those rules, then they'll abide by them. Now it may take a week uh, for everyone to start getting into it because we're getting out of what's been conditioned on the other side of the door. I mean, we're dealing with the prison moors here. We're dealing with the norms of prison. So it's not gonna be an immediate switch. And sometimes even in maybe the third week, a guy may slip up whatever in the rest of the class say, hey, number one, number one, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll call it out, we'll laugh about it and we'll keep going on and, and they will correct the behavior. Uh, but it's about professionalism. In order to, in order to give that professionalism, there's we're trained to always uh, re respect as much as they respect us. In in fact, even more. Uh, so it's it's just we just have to demand it, uh, and and I guess exhibit it is is would be a good word, but we just have to live it. You know, we can't we can't be one way in the breeze way and then another way in the classroom because now we're being hip hypocritical. You know, we're contradicting ourselves. So, and and that's what it does. It, it it allowed me to develop great character, like Raquel said. I knew nothing about any of this. I knew nothing about environment. You told me something about environment. I thought people hug trees. I did not know. You know, and phenomenally. Uh, <laughs> I went from one facility to another facility and this the name popped up again and I said, okay, I was unemployed, I needed a job and wow. And the story about the washing machine, very true in the power, but there was another, I get many stories like this, but there was another gentleman uh, who contacted his sister, a student in the class and informed her about these programs and she got a brand new roof put on her house. A brand new roof, free of charge. The only condition, she couldn't sell the house for the next 15 years. That was the only condition that the utility companies put on it. And that was a direct result of the information that was provided through Roots of Success. So, but to your question specifically, uh, we just demand it. Uh, we, we enforce it. Uh, and pretty soon it becomes conditioned. Leah, the only thing I would add, what, what Grady is talking about is built into the actual teaching guide yes. itself. So yes. it doesn't happen spontaneously. Our teachers go through days and days of training with us in which we go through scenarios and we explore with them and yes. we talk with them about the different ways in which they would, they would put all of these ideas into practice. And then they learn and they share with us, of yes. course, and we learn uh, how to do it. 
Um, it's not unimportant to say that we have uh, over 50% of incarcerated people serving on our advisory board. Grady is also one of those folks. We talk with them, uh, staff arrange for us to talk with them on the phone. We talk with them constantly. They are constantly iterating, contributing, helping us do what we do better. That's a very important part of the model. We're very nimble, we're very flexible. And if something isn't working, we shift it. So what Grady yes. is doing is all thought through beforehand and it works because we've talked to people who've helped us understand how to make it happen. We've learned from them. And as a consequence, it works better. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I love how far spread your program is in different countries even. My little state is surrounded by other states that have it. And I like how the instructors train the next generation of instructors, but how do you get it started in a new state when there's nobody, when there's no one like Grady there to treat, teach anybody? Right. So that's a, that, what state are you in, by the way? I'm in Connecticut. Connecticut. So it's in New York, I saw, and I'm like, so close. Yeah. So far away. So, uh, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. It's, it's a very simple answer. First of all, one of the things I, I wanted to say, and I was hoping someone would ask about, you know, how do you, how much does it cost? We are an almost all volunteer team. I've been a volunteer executive director for 10 years, which is essentially a, like a $350,000 line with benefits. If you think about what we're saving. Um, I don't mean that we would be paying people that, but that's how much work we're all doing. And so it's completely voluntary. We have about $2.4 million in pro bono support. But what we have done is we have kept the costs down very, very, very low so that prisons and also even pr places outside of prison job training programs are incentivized to use the program because these are very under-resourced spaces. So it costs in the very initial stages, $500 for us to teach the first teacher. And after we teach the first teacher, that teacher practices teaching the course three times. And after they've taught the course three times, we then come in and train them to teach other teachers. So the initial cost to a facility would be $560. The teaching manual is $60. And after that, they get to train the next generation of teachers with no cost at all to the program. We do that online, staff arrange for us to work with folks uh, in their offices, uh, you know, supervised using the computer, or we can come into a state, obviously pre-COVID. And after that, the only other cost to run the program is $50 per student. And that's the, that's the charge for the student's workbook where all of the activities are located. And it includes the certificate that the students receive. And in some states, it also receives three to six units of college credit in a community college or a, a four-year institution. So the answer to the question very specifically is we train the first group of teachers or the first one teacher. That teacher teaches the course three times. The course is composed of 10 modules that takes about six hours each. So in most prisons, it's run as a 10 or 15 week program. You can stretch it out. You can do it more quickly. That's up to you. And then after that, that teacher trains the next generation of teachers free of cost for the facility. In jails, nobody's talked about jails yet, but jails are very different places than prisons. They operate very differently and they have very different requirements. In jails, most people are taking roots of success in their cell, online, on a computer or a tablet uh, without a teacher. The entire course is in the computer and I'm the teacher of record in the computer. And the cost is exactly, or the cost is similar. It's $100 per student, um, but uh, it, it, ha it operates without an instructor because jails are not willing to invest because people are serving theoretically short sentences. So, I mean, Raquel, can I say something? I, I would like to you know, don't, I don't want people to leave this workshop with the impression I'm unique. Uh, I'm representative of a lot of other facilitators. I'm representative of my colleagues. I'm not the unique one. Trust me, what you see in me you, I guarantee you, you will see it in a, the majority of people that teach Roots of Success. This is, I'm telling you, is, is, I, it's, it's hard to explain. And also we talked about COVID. We were in the middle of a class during COVID. We didn't get affected. We continued on. 
we continue on with our class. In fact, we were getting ready to schedule before I knew I was getting released in December. We were scheduling our next class practicing uh, the social distancing. We had a classroom set up that could hold 15 people, six feet apart. And we were getting ready to do it again. We were still going. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful program. Be great if folks could just ask questions or share. I have a question. This is Karen from Insight Garden Program. Um, first, thank you so much for this discussion. Welcome home, Grady. Thank you. Um, we have tried piloting um, training inside facilitators, and something we've been trying to research is how to pay them. I'm really curious, kind of your model of how you're able to pay facilitators. And I'm curious, like, is Roots of Success paying them or are they able to be paid from the state? How does it work? Yeah, so uh, that's what a wonderful question. And by the way, thank you for your great, you and your colleagues for such an inspiring presentation. Um, when we approach a Department of Corrections, we approach them with our program model in place. And it requires, although we don't always get this met, but I would say 95% of the time it's being met across the whole country. It requires that they find the funding for our incarcerated men and women to, I don't mean our, for incarcerated men and women to teach the class. They find the funding because it exists as a line item as one of the categories that of jobs that people can hold in a facility. So you can be a janitor, you can be a clerk, you could be an instruct, uh, I guess they're called facilitators in, in most places. Uh, and that, that uh, job is associated with a wage. I'm gonna turn it over to Grady to talk about his experience and, and what he knows, but I do wanna say that most of our teachers take a pay cut in order to leave their manual labor jobs or their clerking jobs, uh, white collar jobs in the facility in order to become teachers in our program because clerks and janitors and people who work in the kitchen earn more than facilitators. But they do that because the work is so fulfilling. But Grady, maybe you can speak about your experience and, and your category in, uh, in Washington. So the, so the answer is the state pays for it, the prison pays for it, they have a budget for it already, there's a line item, and they move people from whatever position they were in to that position as a facilitator and then they get paid full time. And that's the, that's the arrangement we make with them before we allow them to use our program. So in, in part and parcel, I was privy to a conversation with the superintendent uh, when we were talking about Roots of Success and paid instructors. Uh, and he was, you know, that, that point came up. Well, man, we're looking for funding. Pay. I said, OK, well, let's look at it like this. What happens? You got all these guys that come through the class. You guys saying, you know, the behavior is evident. Uh, man, look how much you would pay in order to cure some something ill happening. You know, and I say, so it's a very small price to pay for the end result of the Roots of Success program. It's a very, very small price to pay because we're talking $600 a year. Okay, $600 a year. Some people drink that much coffee in a month. You know what I mean? I think like they, they shouldn't drink that much in a month. You know what I mean? So we're talking $600 a year per instructor who are changing men's lives. We're taking males and making them men. You know what I mean? Giving them that responsibility. We're taught to just do these things. I, and, and it's, to me, it's, it's priceless. I took a lower paying job after I was employed uh, for recent success as an instructor. I was able to go and get another job. And then it was like, it took away from it. So I actually went from what they call a correctional industry job which pays up to $1.70 an hour back to Roots of Success where I got paid 42 cents an hour because the end result to me as a person, as a human, someone like Raquel said, doing life without parole, uh, just seeing men not coming back, seeing them successful, uh, seeing them doing things for their family and contributing some way uh, to that betterment is priceless. But that's a really important question because it's not happening enough that people are being paid to do the work. So I love that question. And the answer is you build it into the model and then you find the line item that corresponds to the position that you're trying to create. 
And then you have to create uh, the momentum for people to be willing to take a pay cut typically in order to move into a lower paying position, but for you know, a more meaningful experience. This is great. We don't work with any prisons in California, but we work with a lot of jails. So I don't know, you know, everything varies state to state. I'm not sure what the specifics would be in California. Hi, um, my name is Caro. I work with Colleen at Urban Resources Initiative. And um, first of all, thank you so much for um, your presentation for all of them. I'm so touched and inspired. Uh, I have, my question is about the community of practice, Grady, that you mentioned a few times. And just want to hear more about what that community of practice is like and how people are staying connected and supporting each other. Um, after they've graduated the program? Well, well we, we stay in touch. Uh, I mean, if it's a student, they'll write back or we can stay in touch with just progress of people that they know on the streets. Uh, the community practice, like Dr. Pendehues was saying, when it comes to the teachers, uh, conference calls are arranged. Uh, and then we can go, uh, if possible, if, if there's access, we can get information uh, from the website. Uh, about what's going on that community uh, and, and within the community, and we can contact Dr. Penderhues. Trust me, she does a, a, a she does a great job at what she does. I, I really don't know how she does it, uh, but she does a great job in keeping people informed, keeping us with, and making us feel included. I mean, so I, I I'm not sure if I'm answering it specifically enough to you, but it's. And man, it's, it's, it's almost like easy because if there's something I need to know about someone or something I want to communicate, and then I can just communicate that to Dr. Penderhues. And then I know that the word will get out, the message will get out, and we'll just keep informed on what each other's doing and everything else. Now, if it comes to technical matters involving the program, she'll get a conference call going, you know, and the administrators are absolutely one of the support of that because they support it and also I will share this back to the funding very quickly is that it seems like they always found the money because they believed in the program and saw the results. So Carolyn I'll try to answer that again from the perspective of the program structure. So every single teacher that is trained at the end of the training they're welcomed into something called the community of practice and we now have thousands of teachers who are incarcerated teaching our course. And that means that they have access in one way or another, in the various way in which Grady's describing, to each other. And we have a very active uh, engagement on the website, which somebody like a family member could access for an incarcerated individual. And that happens all the time, but also which we can access. Uh, one of the budget lines that is built into our program, which I'm sure is built into the other programs as well, is JPay and Connect. So we have phone calls from our teachers on a very constant basis, you know, even weekly sometimes. We are communicating with them through uh, email all of the time. We are sending them supplemental materials. We're communicating with our advisory board and they are communicating with each other. So one of the things that happens within an institution, for example, Grady's experience, is there are four or five teachers that are all Roots of Success trained and they may have more people that they've trained as well. They meet regularly as yes. their mini community of practice. That's what Grady was talking about. Because they're paid full time, they're doing this work 24 seven. They're not just you know, clerking for three hours or from nine to five, they're 24 seven life as a Roots of Success person, right? And that basically means that they're thinking all the time and working together all the time about how to improve the program, about how to serve the individual needs of their students, about how to get people out of trouble, about how to inspire somebody, about yes. how to get somebody connected, about how to help somebody, you know, we have a, you know, a student that lost somebody during that period. How do yeah. we honor that experience? How do we, how do we show up for them? It's, you know, it's, it's, we're always there. That's the model. That's how they're trained. Uh, it doesn't happen accidentally. It's true that the people who teach for us may have these inclinations, but it's also true that a lot of them don't. Uh, Grady and I always think about the same person 
who teaches with him, who doesn't have the, the spirit that Grady does, that, you know, is, is automatically reaching out to others. We Dave. have to train and work Dave. with him. Right. I, I wasn't saying his name because we have other people around the, in, the, in the line who come from our program. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we, we nurture and the teachers nurture each other. And then on the outside, when people come out, those connections actually formally happen within the program itself. So everybody gets everybody else's contact information. We tell people at the end of the training, we are a family. If somebody calls you, you answer their phone. If somebody's in your town, they stay at your house. If somebody needs something, you give them what they need. I mean, we've had folks go to South Africa and be hosted by our South African teams. So this is a really serious part of our, of our, of our pedagogy. It's built into the model that we are a family. Uh, which I think is also built into the model of some of the other programs that have spoken today, but it's very intentional and it's structured into the program. And then I think also, as Grady pointed out, we work with the administration to ensure high levels of contact with our teachers and advisory board members, so we can keep it going that way. Thank you so much. Please feel free to share your experiences in your own programs or ask more questions. Uh, we're, we're hoping this will focus on implementation practice. I have a quick question about, um, maybe not quick. How, what kind of networks have you all cultivated in Washington? That's where you all are kind of primarily centered in with like community organizations and places that might hire people. What, what does that look like kind of on the other side as people kind of return home? And are you doing a lot of work on kind of like networking and job sourcing or kind of providing and promoting the skills? And then just like, yeah, talk to me a little bit about what that looks like. Grady, I'm gonna take this one, but one thing, Leah, that you're allowing me to have an opportunity to say, which I've been wanting to say for the hour, is that our most important partner in the state of Washington is the Sustainable Prisons Program. I just wanna honor them. I want to acknowledge them. I know that Elise Kelly is on the line. I'm not sure if anybody else from their program is here. We would not be able to run this program in the state of Washington without the Sustainable Prison Program. They don't do that work for us in any other state, but they are also an important conduit in other states, not all, but some. But within the state of Washington, SPP is our partner. Uh, they run this program for the Department of Corrections and everything that we are able to do happens because of SPP. So I just wanna acknowledge their extremely important role. I meant to do that in the beginning because we were here with Grady, but I forgot. So thank you for the opportunity. The answer to that question is because we're a national program, we do have very deep relationships in the localities in which we work, some more than others. We work more in Washington, more in Chicago, more in Oregon, more in Ohio, more in New York, more in the Bay than in some other places. But we have deep relationships with everybody in Louisiana, Kentucky, whatever. Um, and what that means is that we work with the programs that receive people when they re-enter. And they are the ones who establish relationships with employers. And a larger part of my work is that I have a green job training model, which is used around the country as well. And it has built into it something called an employer's council. And so I work with a lot of the jurisdictions to set up these green employer's councils. And then those employer's councils are able to welcome some of the folks uh, and, and embrace them and, and connect them to employment. In Washington, we actually, actually don't have that relationship. And that's because SPP holds that relationship and they do an amazing job. So um, it happens to be somewhat atypical, but usually we're interfacing with community-based organizations that are doing that work when folks get out. We're, we're not doing that work ourselves, except in the Bay where we have, the Bay in Chicago and New York where we have offices. Can we talk but, about- but, but, but I want to say something that I think is important. So in Roots of Success, we prepare people for 125 jobs in the water, waste, energy, transportation, building, food, health, and agriculture, and community organizing sectors. And we have a Green Jobs and Career Pathways guidebook that gives them an enormous amount of information on everything they need to know about those 125 jobs. 
most of which do not require a high school degree, none of which require a college degree. Of course, there are barriers related to people's criminal records, but in most states, we can get around those. And what I wanted to say is that they don't all need those uh, CBOs. They are ready when they graduate from our program to pick up the phone or go into the internet, apply for a position and get to the point where they can, they can, uh, I don't know what's the word, they can successfully have an interview with an employer and get to the point where they will want to be hired. They may not be hired after a background check, which happens to people all the time, but they have passed to the point where they are ready to be hired because our work readiness component is extremely rigorous. That's what Grady was describing. And they don't need those CBOs to match them with jobs. Grady, go. Sorry. Well, no, it's, 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 we're talking about jobs and employment with the mock interviews. And one of the things we're trained to always uh, get the students to understand is how they present themselves. And, they, and that's very important when they go for interviews or in life. You could be a five-star meal, but if you present yourself on a garbage can lid, you're not going to be attractive. So you have to present yourself properly in order to get to, to, get to your goal, to achieve what you're trying to achieve to. And that's what we're trained to do. That's what we do. And, and we stress that very, very importantly. And there's a big demonstration I give on it. You guys just love it. But it, presentation is how we present ourselves that, man, you, you go in dressed looking like you're ready to go to work that day. You know what I mean? You come prepared. You, you, it's how you present yourself. And I want to add one other thing. One of the reasons that I started the Roots of Success program, Leah, was because I did a study with employers in 22 sectors of the green economy and asked the question, what would it take for you to hire people with lower levels of skill and criminal records, which I didn't go into in the beginning because I didn't know if we have enough time. But the, the thing that the, the, the most important criteria for those employers was not that people knew how to do the work. They could actually train people for entry level jobs from solar to urban gardening and everything in between in three months sometimes much less. It was that people understood the mission of the firm, why the work was important. So although Grady is talking about the importance of presentation and resumes and cover letters, that is all real. And especially for folks who are incarcerated or re-entered or come from underserved communities. But the reality is our folks graduate with the knowledge. Yes. They know more about environmental problems than most of us on screen today. And the reason I could say that is because most of us on the screen are siloed in, 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 in sectors. You know a lot about energy, I know a lot about food or agriculture, but we don't all know about all of the sectors. Roots of Success is a comprehensive graduate school education in environmental issues, problems, and injustices. And I'm not saying that uh, collo you know, colloquially. I'm saying that because I'm a professor and I know what that means when you graduate from an environmental studies program. Our students know that much. So at the point of the interview, or even at the point in which they're writing the cover letter, they are communicating that knowledge to the employer and the employer is impressed, very impressed. And Grady and I have thousands of graduates at almost 20, I said 25, but we now have almost 28,000 graduates, thousands of people working in multiple sectors of the economy, almost everybody with a criminal record. And so let's not leave out financial literacy. Right. I mean, that's very important as well. Let's, let's not leave some people to, to get money and don't understand. You know how many people don't even know what FICO means? They don't, they don't even know what it means. You know, I ask, well, okay, what does it mean? It's an acronym. What does it mean? You know, guys don't know. They don't understand how they break down the credit store. I got out of prison January 28th, went and bought me an automobile, the guy, the salesman told me he checked my credit score. It was 819. Phenomenal. 819. And yeah, I couldn't believe it. But it was some of the things we learned to do and how to get as a secondary cardholder on an account and use it in that name in order to get yourself into the transaction. I mean, 819. I was shocked. I was like, wait, you sure that's me? I was, I was like, so about it's your important. Friends more than you are about roots of success. <laughs> <laughs> Something to be proud of, Grady. Yes, thank you.
thank you. I mean that sincerely because the curriculum, well, I'm, I mean, the program is, man, it's just awesome. In terms of the pedagogy, which we haven't talked about enough, the, the whole idea is that we meet people where they're at. So in our module on financial literacy, for example, this is not Bank of America 101. We talk about credit scores in FICO. People need to know that. It's about predatory lending. It's about vulture capitalism. Yes. It's about the shock doctrine. It's about chaos theory. It's about why um, capitalism you know, preys on vulnerable populations. It's about how you understand your place as a consumer and how you make sense of you know, what you want versus what you need and how, how you're a victim of, you know, uh, they learn about, you know, perceived obsolescence and planned obsolescence. I mean, they become experts on, yes. on, 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 the, on the supply chain, literally experts on the supply chain. So when people come out from the financial literacy uh, module, which happens after all the other modules, they are informed consumers. They understand how they have been manipulated to buy things that they don't need that or and the impact that that has not only on the environment but on the workers who are not paid um, we don't view the environment by the way as the natural world we define the environment as environmental justice activists where we live work play pray and play and that happens on the very first day of class and that brings people into a conversation about the environment pedagogically that allows them to understand that they have something to to connect to here this is not about fossil fuels and climate change until later. This is about how did you use water today? How did you get to the, to the program today? Uh, you know, what do we, how's the energy that we're using? Where does it come from? But in the financial literacy module, people learn um, how also to talk, to, to think, for example, about how to say yes or no to people when they come around and ask for a portion of your check to avoid the drama that's associated with that conversation if you haven't had a chance to think about how you wanna handle it. There are scenarios that put people in the position of re-entering and rethinking, how do I want to think about money? How do I wanna think about relationships in relationship to money? How do I wanna think about myself as a consumer? How do I think about myself as uh, an earner? So I'll stop here, but all of these things are built into a pedagogical approach that basically deeply honors and respects where the population comes from. And, and that's for every single individual in the class who have very diverse experiences. Not everybody is low income. Not everybody is, is, has been failed by the system. Some people are higher income and have college educations. They're in the class together. And each one of them has to uniquely be able to relate to the content through their own lens. And that's what the popular education model allows us to do as teachers. Raquel, that was a really good question that popped up in the oh, chat yeah. about, I don't, I don't know much about this stuff, so bear with me, please. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I see that question, yep. How can potential employers connect with students from your program when they come home? Do they need to contact the lo local reentry services you work with? So I don't know who asked that question, but if you send me an email and you tell me which state you're in, I will immediately put you in touch with our programs and teachers uh, because I'm not sure if it's the local reentry programs in that state or that city or that place or other CBOs. But uh, just send me an email at Raquel at Roots of Success and I'll, I'll do my best if we're in your state or city. Thank you. That was me. I'm in Massachusetts. We have a lot of programs in Massachusetts. Great. A lot. Yeah. So we have about 10 more minutes. Uh, it would be wonderful to hear from some more folks. We don't want to do all the talking. We want to learn. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm late. I missed, I missed the first half. So if this question has been answered already, um, sincerely, I apologize. Um, is this for when you're like the Roots of Success program? It sounds like it's a school. Is it for college students, existing college students? Is it its own standalone kind of thing? I'm sorry, like I said, I'm, I'm late to the party. I apologize. I love that question because it allows me to give you this answer. So we're gathered here today to talk about the Roots of Success Environmental Literacy and Work Readiness Program as it is 
um, offered in prisons, jails, and juvenile facilities. And in those facilities, in those settings, it's a 60 hour course. It's taught primarily by incarcerated men and women in prisons, well, exclusively by incarcerated men and women in prisons, and then by staff in jails and juvenile facilities, and also by youth in juvenile facilities. And in that case, the program is internal to those settings. But Roots of Success is also taught in other settings, in job training programs, in reentry programs, in high schools, in youth programs. We have a Spanish speaking version. And what I wanted to say here is there are 10, 11 now customized versions of Roots of Success for different populations. So the version that we use with incarcerated youth is not the same version we use with high school youth, which is not the same version we use with youth who have dropped out of school who are not incarcerated. There are three different versions for youth in different settings. The version that we use in jails is not the version we use in prisons. The version that we use with Spanish speaking populations is a different version as well, because it has to be culturally competent in that, with that population. Um, so there are different versions of Roots of Success. All of them, except for one, are 60 hour courses. Uh, maybe I should say two. The online course that students take self-paced on their own in a computer really has no time frame. They do it in their own time frame. But there is a one-year course, which is a common core aligned course for high school teachers, which is taught primarily in science classes. But every other version is 60 hours instructor-led by instructors like Grady. And these are self-contained classes. They're not in, um, in any particular uh, college. Although, although many of our job training programs have these classes taught in college, and students receive college credit for our courses. As a matter of fact, I'm working in, with a program, uh, an urban ag program. We work with so many urban ag programs, by the way, folks, because I know there's so many of you on the, on the line. Uh, we work with this amazing program called Growing Home, Windy City Harvest in Chicago. And Growing Home is now starting to offer our Roots of Success class taught by their instructors in the college, community college, for students who will receive college credit and many of these students don't even have a high school degree. They will have three to six units of college credit banked for them, which is incredibly inspiring. But Janessa, in this moment, I think I said your name right, I hope, we're talking about the course being taught as a self-contained series of classes in prisons, jails, and juvenile facilities taught by incarcerated men and women. Understood. Um, and thank you. Uh, Follow-up question. Also, it's Janessa, super close. Janessa. Happens all the time. Right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Nisa. Like your like your knee. Um, uh, is there is there plans to expand that into more uh, community colleges? And 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 I I have a very good friend who is in she was in the butterfly program in Washington State in the uh, sustainability prisons project. Yeah, and no. she's actually why I'm I'm here now. Is is she she told me about this whole this whole thing. And um, I I am excited to see programs like this. And I I'm interested if there's any interest in the program to get like more like expand the network or do get get more allies on the sides of of these incarcerated men and women and things yes yes no that would be fantastic we don't have any uh institutions of higher education that are offering college credit for people going through the course in washington or teaching it so we would love to make that happen so let's talk and maybe involve spp in that conversation as well since it's washington and See if we can make that happen. Just send an email to Raquel at Roots of Success or Grady at Roots of Success. Grady's new email. I will. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Great to meet you. We just have about five minutes left. I'm not sure how to um, how to how to wind down, except to say that Grady and I. Well, first of all, this is the first time that I've gotten to work with Grady outside of a prison. I just want to say, Grady, it feels so good to see you at the other end of the screen. And you know how much I love you. So I just want to publicly state how beautiful this is for us and that this is a, a continuation of a relationship, but in a new setting that's really very important to both of us. Um, but I just, I want to thank everybody for the amazing work that we're doing. Um, it's incredibly inspiring to, to be here with you. Um, we feel very honored to be able to share our work. We hope that you will 
tell other people about Roots of Success. We don't have any other way of getting the word out about our program because we're primarily an all volunteer staff. And so we just don't have any bandwidth for outreach. The only way people hear about it is word of mouth. We feel like there's a lot of complementarity between what we're doing and what a lot of you are doing. And we would love to be a part of people's programs. We had hoped, for example, early to work with Insight and Planting Justice, but it just didn't happen. So we would love to be integrated into already existing great programs, which we feel we're just uh, you know, the educational component for. And I just wanna say finally that as a, as a teacher, it is very important to understand the relationship between the hands-on work, which helps you understand the work itself and an opportunity to understand why the work is important. And they are complementary, but they're different. And so there is room in really great programs that are doing the work, um, you know, the hands-on work for an educational component. And I feel very committed to ensuring that people who come from the communities most impacted by environmental problems and injustices have the deep science and, science and social science um, understanding that the system has robbed them of having an opportunity to access. Uh, and they, you know, they can understand it as well as we can, but they haven't had the opportunity to, to, to have the knowledge shared with them. And so I just wanna encourage all of us to think about the importance of of providing people with the deep, deep understanding of these issues that is required, these are complex issues, um, to, to fully understand why the work has so much meaning. Um, and not only that the work has meaning in and of itself. Sorry, Grady. Yeah, well, I just, I just wanted to share my appreciation and gratitude, uh, my humility, especially uh, for the last over decade or so, I've always lived by the words of Sir Edmund Burke. Uh, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Uh, so every day I wake up, how can I be better today than I was yesterday? And I look forward to being better tomorrow. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, we talk about empowerment, seeing people change their lives for the better. <laughs> you can't beat it. Roots of success, you can't beat it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think well, thank you so much for this informative presentation on so many levels. Um, really appreciate both of you being here. Um, and thank you all to all of our participants. Um, we hope to see many of you here um, with us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you should get a reminder with that link. Um, and other than that, um, uh, we look forward to continue to uh, engage these questions and we once again thank these final presenters and thank all of our presenters and participants today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, guys. Thank you and congratulations, Grady. <laughs>